Ladies and gentlemen, would you kindly return to your seats? The program is about to continue. The program is about to continue. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch and you're rested and ready for another afternoon. Um, I hope you agree with me that this morning's been a really interesting and hopefully innovative and engaging session where we've heard from different leaders from different countries who aren't afraid to address the fact that NATO has challenges, including internal challenges with Turkey, the row over Turkey with uh, Macron's comments, but also keen to look to the future and celebrate 70 years of defence. Uh, next up, we have a discussion on artificial intelligence, hypersonic missiles, and the implications for future warfare. Now, when I was writing a piece on AI and warfare earlier this year, I spoke to a number of senior military officials who'd been involved in thinking about this for the UK and other countries, and several of them pointed me to a company that was doing worlds to help decision makers. We're now going to have a presentation from the CEO and founder of that company, Improbable, uh, Herman Narula, uh, who will talk a little bit about how his company is using that technology to help uh, simulate scenarios, crisis dynamics in ways that are directly being used by the Alliance. Uh, all, please welcome to the stage Mr. Herman Narula. Right. Um, it's wonderful to be here and a real privilege to talk to such an interesting audience about these topics today. Um, I think what I would like to start with, rather than jumping right into technology, is talking for a moment about what the problem actually is that I feel that, you know, in our discussions with institutions like NATO really needs to be addressed and to be considered. And I think at its heart, it's very simple. There's a fundamental challenge in making decisions in the world that we now find ourselves in. And, you know, the basic principles of making decisive decisions, coming to consensus, understanding a situation, have been used to great effect by government and military organizations for decades and decades and decades. I think the problem we now have is we have sort of three new and unique demons that need to be dealt with. And they kind of confound many of the challenges and problems that we face in the modern world, whether climate change, whether security, whether hybrid warfare. And those problems are really straightforward. Complexity, speed, and confidence. And in particular, I think complexity. You know, we're now drowning in information, drowning in complex, multi-domain, multi-modal problems. Problems don't sit in their boxes anymore. They tend to come out and infect each other. Climate change impacts security. Migration impacts everything. There are so many different interconnected systems we now need to deal with in the modern world. And one of the consequences of that is unintended consequences, really, in many ways. Uh, an impact can impact the world in ways that no one previously predicted because of how fast and how connected the world has become. So what do we do? How do we create a better model for decision making in a world where this situation exists? And I think one of the most important key ideas to remember is technology is never going to solve this problem unless we find a way to augment and improve human decision making. I think there are technologists out there that believe that AI is a magic panacea that will fix the issues we all face in dealing with making choices in a complex world. I think that is fantasy and it will be fantasy for a considerably longer period of time than we would all like to believe. And it's not only technological, I mean AI is very limited, but it's also cultural. Um, you know, in this room and you know, across NATO and other organizations, there are human beings that have been trusted to make critical decisions. In the end, those decisions must be accountable. They must be accountable as a democratic, liberal sort of society we're all comfortable supporting. So we need a technological solution then that can ultimately improve how humans make decisions and more importantly, help them manage complexity. That's going to be key to any real future for massive decision-making organizations in a hyper-connected world. And I just want to underscore this problem. Like, this is a crisis that just gets worse the more connected the world becomes. The more systems that we start introducing that start talking with one another or, or in operating autonomously. 
the more connected our world becomes in trade, in online worlds, in communication, the harder it becomes to deal with this issue. And I think at a certain point, if we don't augment and upgrade our alliances and our partnerships and our institutions, they'll just snap. They'll just be unable to deal appropriately with a changing world. So what then could be some of the ingredients that could go into that solution? After just saying AI was not the answer, I'm not going to bring AI back to the table for a moment because there are some things AI can do very, very well. And one of them is find patterns. What AI is very good at in the modern world is helping us understand how to sift through information and make that available to human decision makers in a useful way. And I see a big future and a big part of everything I'm going to talk about today. In the back of your mind, think about the value of AI as you know it today as a tool in enabling a lot of this. But beyond AI, I want to introduce or even reintroduce some of you to another concept, which is the concept of models. Now, you've all encountered these in different forms. As a kid, when playing with uh, simple toys and tools, or even in the context of large-scale simulation in areas like weather. But models are very profound and very powerful. There are ways for us to create representations of the real world that can give human beings an intuition on how the real world operates. Models really are there to be played with, to be experimented with, to create and provide insight. And you know, they're used in a military context today, in a very simplistic context, one might argue. Um, literally, paper modeling is still an important tool um, used by many institutions to make important uh, preparations and plans. But we're now in a world where we can do so much more than that. We can augment that in profound ways. And that's because we're living in the age of distributed computation. So for those of you that don't know, distributed computation is the idea that we can make massive applications by bringing together thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines and huge amounts of computing power. And combining that with AI and modeling techniques means that we can start to recreate the real world. And we can start to create profound models of the world that have utility beyond that which we have previously seen. And this is already happening. In fact, billions of people are already engaging with technology like this. They're just having fun with it. They're just playing video games. And gaming and gaming technology and virtual world solution in the way that we look to represent the world, model the world, create interactive simulations that I think have profound implications for decision makers. And the reason for that is really because the technology is going well beyond what we've previously seen. These are just examples today of games powered by technology like ours that instead of running on a single machine, run on thousands of machines. That game there, Seed, uh, involves literally millions of artificial intelligent um, NPCs working together in a persistent world. Um, and all of this is in a kind of Cambrian explosion of new opportunities that have only happened in the last five years. So you get the idea. The things your kids are playing at home may actually have more of an important role to play in the way our society runs than we've previously considered. Um, you put all of these things together, the technology behind gaming in virtual worlds, distributed computation, AI, modeling, wargaming, and you can start to build a picture of what a better framework for decision making might look like. And I think that better framework for decision making would have some pretty profound implications on how we plan and how we train. Planning today, it's extremely static and extremely slow. It means making massive long-term preparations for consistent, well-understood situations and picking between plans. Now, we know in a hyper-connected, ever-changing world that that just isn't as effective as it could be. We need a much more adaptive way of planning. We need a much more... Um, a way for large institutions to improvise, to operate on their feet, to think with agility. And that can't happen in a world of static planning. Similarly, training. Um, you know, training in defense institutions has always been, in many ways, a cost-saving measure when it's been done through virtual worlds. It's been a way of practicing rote behavior. But in a hyper-connected, ever-changing world with new challenges that need to be dealt with at the speed of geopolitical change, we need an environment where people can train at massive scale and where they can plan in a much more adaptive way. So really, putting all of that together, what I would prescribe as a, a key idea in how all of this can change things, is to imagine a world where we can partake in perpetual connected rehearsal. Imagine if we could represent and recreate the world at, at realistic scale, and have hundreds of thousands of individuals interacting within that world, 
planning, practicing, trying scenarios long before they are augmented or used in the real world. That would be a sea change in how we think, in how we make decisions. It would create experience of events that have not occurred. It would create the ability for us to play with our assumptions, to try things that we have not tried in the real world or could not try in the real world. And the technology to do all of this isn't miles away. It exists right now. It's here now. What's really required is to embrace the idea that a better way of operating could exist. So what we call the single synthetic environment is really the key basic principle behind putting all of this together. This is the idea of defense institutions taking together all of their siloed training and planning and running a single virtual simulation of an entire theater or an entire strategic context. And for the first time, institutions in the UK, the US, and now NATO are beginning to trial and practice this type of environment. And all of this is, I think, going to change the way we think about making choices. So my time is up, but I want to show one quick thing before we go. This is a simulation that hopefully will augment itself and start running that looks at an entire theater and models population, traffic, infrastructure, telco networks, power grids, real-world training, all of these things coming together in a multi-domain simulation that is already producing very interesting conclusions about how we can make choices and how we can make decisions. So I think this is an inevitability. I think this is technology that is going to get embraced, and I think this is probably the future of how we can augment humans and make better choices in the way we operate. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome to the stage Director of Live Media Content at Fortune Magazine, Ms. Maithri Sirathamran. Wow, oh, that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you very much for that, Herman. Um, I want to quickly introduce uh, the rest of the panel that Herman's going to be joining us on. Um, Carlos Avian is the co-founder and CEO of QSide. He'll be running us through some really interesting um, technology that he's been developing as well. Uh, and of course, General Andre Lenata is the Supreme Allied Commander of Transformation at NATO. We're honored to have you join the conversation, General. And of course, Herman, thank you for sticking on with us. Uh, my name is Maitri Sithabraman. A few points of... Uh, Housekeeping, I will be coming to you for your questions pretty early on in the conversation. I'm going to gather about three at a time. Um, I would request you to keep the question quite short, introduce yourself and the organization that you work with, and that way we can get many, many more points of view across the room. Right, so as we get started, and we've had a chance to listen to Herman's um, spotlight. General, I'm going to come to you um, to bring up a few points that Herman did. We're looking at hyperconnected worlds, as Herman said. We're looking at warfare changing, the landscape changing. And the question for NATO at this point is, are you changing? And are you changing fast enough? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. Uh, welcome uh, to Herman and, and, and you. Uh, of course, uh, the, um, our environment is changing. It's not, uh, it's not new. Um, probably the fact today is that we are facing a new kind of change. You, you, you talked about uh, the, the pace of this change, uh, new kind of war. We can talk about shadow wars. Uh, somebody talked about that in re recently. Um, we face um, confrontation uh, in multi-domain, space, cyber, um, formation sphere, uh, uh, Herman talk, talk about uh, and um, for uh, organization like NATO we already need to deal with a new technological and industrial ecosystem so it makes many things uh, together uh, it is the reason why we are challenged uh, and uh, we need to adapt uh, since its inception NATO proves that it, it has uh, adapted uh, 70 years ago, we, we faced many different uh, change, and we continue to adapt. Uh, I, I, I can say maybe two, two, com two comment. Military cooperation is working quite well, uh, even 
uh, since his, uh, his, his seventh years, uh, things move uh, so, so, so fast and continue uh, so fast. So I want first to deliver a very positive message, despite uh, some political concern we all, all recognize, military co co cooperation is still there and works on the field. Our forces are able to work uh, together I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but we proved that we adapted our military instrument of war through these 70 years. Second, my command helps uh, NATO uh, military instrument to, uh, of power to adapt. We continue to scan uh, this environment to understand trends and to inform the political level. We plan uh, the forces we need for tomorrow through a defense planning process. We uh, explore new technologies, and Herman well know how we try to partner with new partners. We uh, deliver new capabilities through common funded capabilities. We educate and train. We are, are very keen to, um, to look at interoperability through all these different uh, threats. Mm -hmm. Regarding especially the theme of today, uh, emerging technologies, um, we also work a lot on, on that. It proves that we are looking forward. Tomorrow, I hope, I, I'm confident that the leaders will approve the emerging and disruptive technology roadmap. We work a lot on it. We, uh, uh, and ACT was uh, at the beginning of the, of the, of the story uh, pushing uh, some elements in order to uh, inform the, the, politi the political level. And I think we'll come back to that because tomorrow is going to be quite interesting and the next couple of days will be interesting to listen to. But when you're working with the startups and the environment that you're working in, data becomes a big issue and data has always been a big issue and sharing it amongst NATO members is another big issue, let alone the world, where I want to come back to you, Carlos, and talk about some of the technology that you're developing. You don't currently work with NATO. Uh, perhaps this is your opportunity to pitch it. He did with, he was 35 under 35 with MIT. So there you go. <laughs> it's a good opportunity. Tell us a little bit more about protecting the data because that's where the arguments really begin. Do we share the data? What happens to the data when it's out there? It's not just the NATO uh, and the political circles that are grappling with that problem. You've got technology companies grappling with that problem. So tell us about, a little bit about QSight and your tech. So something that, uh, I mean, so that we've been seeing with artificial intelligence and this type of new technologies like quantum computation also is something that is opening a whole new range of possibilities for developing and deploying and augmenting our capacity for doing things. But at the same time, we have to be also conscious that these two technologies in particular can pose a threat to the way that we exchange data online, right? And for a society that we're increasingly connecting everything that we can on the internet, our critical infrastructures, our vehicles, uh, our private communication. So we need to balance and, you know, not only develop the technologies, but also making sure that we can protect the way that we exchange data online. Because in, in, uh, in this hyper-connected sphere, uh, if we can no longer share data in a secure way, then we might get into trouble. So uh, the same, this is like the, the, side, uh, the downside of these developments. But the good news is that uh, on these two technologies at the same time can be used to help us improve the security of our data. There is a lot of efforts on deploying what is called quantum safe server security solutions. This is something that is happening, that standardizations are moving along, that organizations are tr uh, starting to try, and that is evolving very fast. So you need to be very quick on adapting, on deploying new things, on testing them. But at the same time, because of the criticality of the matter, we need to also make sure that's compatible with, with what we've been doing so far and being able to complement to the point in which we can get to communication networks that are future proven so that we do not have to worry that our private information, our secrets, our confidential or classified information at some point in the future might be uh, the unencrypted, so basically uh, that become on the public domain. So this pick up, pick, picks up a, an interesting point that I want to kind of wrap this initial roundup with you, Herman, is there is so much technology that's being developed in the private sector in the startup space, but there's also hesitation at, at some level amongst many startups of working with the defense industry or with military or with government. How do you make that thinking change 
And what does NATO, for example, need to do to appeal to Carlos, as they did to you? I'd say I think NATO has a unique ability to solve this problem because NATO is a consensus-building organization and it has, I think, personally, a pretty good brand. Um, you know, in the startup world, in the engineering community, there can be a lot of cynicism uh, towards intelligence organizations, defense institutions in your home country, etc. I think NATO has a fairly positive initial Does it? read. I, I would say, at least from my own internal conversations and beyond, mostly because people are less familiar with it. Um, you know, there's, it, it, feels like a, a, it feels like a more, a more kind of multinational, more consensus-building organization to people. I also think NATO has a power to make commercially the ability to work with defense institutions considerably easier. Because one of the challenges you have when trying to work as a startup is you have maybe one customer, two customers mm -hmm. um, in your home country that are in that space. NATO can open that up to lots of other customers and create standardization. One thing I would add, though, is I think it's a mistake to imagine that we can carry on with the idea of defense institutions and governments simply being customers uh, for technology the way that they have been for large uh, hardware and platforms. That's just not how this type of technology works. They have to be co-developers, participants. They have to be involved in the process of making this. And I think what we've found in our interactions is that that willingness exists, but it needs to be supercharged with uh, cultural change and with a real ability and comfort in taking risks. Maybe uh, two comments, one on NATO roles and responsibility, and then the other one on the best way to partner with uh, new high tech companies. Uh, first on NATO roles, Everybody should understand that NATO do not own the wall uh, capabilities that uh, NATO is able to provide on the field. 95% uh, of these capabilities are coming from the nations. So NATO all is here to coordinate this endeavor with 29 nations in order to bring all these capabilities into the same direction, uh, bringing interoperability, being, bringing the same uh, uh, priorities, uh, and so on. But regarding uh, innovation, nations are able to provide their own solutions and partner at their level. Uh, so at, at the NATO level, we try to understand, give the strategic direction, organize interoperability, organize procedures, concepts and doctrine, and so on. Bring everybody together. Regarding now the best way to partner uh, with, um, with these uh, new companies, as I said a few uh, minutes ago, my opinion is that we face something which is different than the, the way we are used to develop and uh, uh, provide our capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, before, we were, we were used to direct innovation. We, uh, and this innovation was mainly coming from the traditional defense uh, industrial system. Today, uh, the, the, this, especially in the digital world, this innovation is, com is driven by the market uh, and, and uh, by small companies much more agile than the traditional uh, defense uh, structure. And it is the reason why we need to adapt to understand these new ecosystems. They are not waiting for us. They don't need us. The market is driving them. And, uh, and in order to find the best way to partner with them, to bring them and uh, to go to, to, to their way of, of work in terms of more bottom-up approach, more user-centric approaches. Uh, and it is uh, the reason why we partner with, uh, with um, society Could like... Could you explain the user-centric approach a little bit more and the bottom-up versus top-down? I, I will e e explain that to you very, very easy. If you, uh, if you ask to a soldier, what do you need uh, regarding artificial intelligence, he, he will not be able to, uh, to say uh, anything. Uh, on the previous world, we were used to ask to, to, to the users, what do you need? And they, and they write a requirement, and, and, and we forward this requirement to the industry, and a few years after, uh, too much years on my opinion, but a few years after, <laughs> we, had, we, we had the right product. Uh, today, it doesn't work like that. We, we do not bring requirement on the, on the table. We need to bring issues, operational problems on the table, and work together with solution provider in order to fix that, uh, that, that, uh, that problem. That's more uh, bottom-up, that's only bottom-up, and, and it's a question of partnership between operational users and solution providers. And after that, we bring that to the field, we experiment and we implement, we fix, we, we adjust, we adapt, and we implement uh, into our capabilities. 
I think that brings up a question that I, I know it would probably be on a lot of people's minds. A few things that you all touched on cannot negate from the fact that there is a debate ongoing whether the, the strategic alliance as declared by uh, President Putin uh, between China and Russia puts them ahead of the curve when it comes to AI, hypersonics, uh, in terms of the data that they are able to sit on, utilize. The Chinese are currently, um, by many, many reports, also attempting to set re international regulations on these. Does that concern you as private sector folk who, are, who have to develop based on data that's out there and the validity of that data? And how much does it concern you when maybe there is a debate that is NATO a little too slow, maybe the perception of you being slightly behind the curve than the Chinese and the Russians as competitors? Who wants to go first? Feel free. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning the it's difficult. There are two problems with this, as the question is posed. The first is that um, in some technologies and advantages, uh, how many, I mean, I'm not a soldier or a politician, but just to use analogies and examples that are neutral, uh, how much resource or production capacity or money uh, somebody has. There are very clear linear advantages and disadvantages. In an area like AI, I'm not so clear that there is such a thing as being ahead or behind in as obvious a way. Mm -hmm. Because when technology that is not scarce, that can be developed and then copied very quickly, is created, um, appropriating it from either side becomes really, really straightforward. Um, you know, a a AI is not something that, uh, you know, is, 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 in my opinion, particularly defensible. Um, you know, the techniques and technologies behind deep learning once discovered are now being applied by everyone. You know, you can go home and do it. Um, so I think that's one point. These technologies may require a different set of perspectives on advantage. The second is that the real problem for private sector companies is we have markets in the world, China is an example, which, and probably the big example, which are completely protected and totally controlled by state-backed um, industrial giants that have not only a local captive market to develop enormous success and resources in, mm -hmm. but have a very close relationship with government and with, that allows them to have access to data, to resources, to infrastructure. I'm not making a comment on whether that's good or bad. Um, you know, we work in China, it's the biggest games market in the world. But I think there is an opportunity to think of how close partnerships between government and companies, uh, you know, in NATO countries can create a similar explosion of economic value. Um, you know, maybe there are, maybe there are, maybe there are non-intuitive things we could do that could be great. If I can get Carlos's perspective and then General yours, then we'll take some questions from the audience. So I guess that going a little bit on the AI and the <clears throat> data sharing perspective, something that is happening actually, there are massive investments in China, for instance, to deploying uh, what is called quantum safe server security or even invest massive investments on developing quantum computers, right? So in this perspective, uh, the fact that they concentrate all of this capacity into investing in, a, in, a, in a, just a sole research center might give this edge, but I guess that uh, in, in, in the U.S. and Europe and many of the other countries, that we, we do have the people that can lead these efforts, and it's a matter of coordinating. The opportunity is there, the people is here, so basically leading on this space is essential. Not only from the quantum computing side that can be used for a lot of computing things, but also as a code-breaking machine, but also on security, because security is a kind of a binary thing. Either you have it or you don't have it, right? So there is not, yeah, I can put a, put a backdoor so I can uh, look at information when I want. If you put that, you put it for everyone. So on, on this respect, I guess we, we are on, a, on an opportunity uh, setting that we should definitely exploit. Does it concern you, sir? Uh, maybe some comments. Uh, first of all, you mentioned hypersonic for me, uh, the, the AI and all this digital innovation is very different than uh, uh, hypersonic, which is more traditional one, mm -hmm. uh, uh, top-down, uh, directed innovation. We identify clearly the goal, and we put the, the energy and the investments in order to reach this goal. And I'm not sure we are late on that. Uh, uh, we, there is a competition, and it is a, a, a traditional strategic competition on that field. Regarding uh, a, uh, the, the, the other world, if I may, um, things are different. There is also a competition. Uh, our competitors are investing a lot. We, 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 we know that. But the question is not about technology. As, uh, uh, as um, Herman mentioned, the technology is there, and it's there for everybody. So the question is the pace of adaptation, not the technology. 
And we are not late on the technology. We are the, the best skills, uh, the best uh, uh, startups, industries uh, at 29 nations. We will succeed uh, at, at, at this level. The question is the use. Uh, we, 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 we will have with this technology and it is the reason why here we need to find a, a, a new kind of partnership between governments and uh, this new uh, high-tech ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's in, it, it is something we need to uh, invent here. Um, and and we, we already experiment new ways to partner with, uh, with them. On, 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 my, on my opinion, it is uh, the best way. But I, I would like to mention also another thing here. Uh, in, in this world, data will be key. Uh, data is the new fuel, the, the fuel of the 21st century. And the way we collect, share uh, massively uh, data will give us more options uh, and more powerful tool for tomorrow. So it is also a question we need to solve, including with, uh, with this uh, high-tech world. Uh, because some You're of them... not concerned that we're sitting with massive amounts of data coming out of China and Russia and them having a quote-unquote strategic... Th that's, alliance. The point, that's the point I, w I would like to come. M my opinion is uh, the Chinese system is much more integrated than, uh, than our one, uh, partnering between government uh, industries and uh, armed forces. Uh, and the question is, uh, of course, uh, because we apply different rules and, and it is, we, we protect our, our values, we need to consider this ability to, to build this integrated uh, uh, system uh, because we see also on our, on our side some a kind of reluctance of, of some IT company to, to partner with governments. This is, in my opinion, a very Western question. Yeah. Let's get two questions from the audience. Um, uh, if you have one, one, the gentleman with the glasses there and the lady in the front in the brown jacket. So we'll go to the gentleman first. Please introduce yourself. Quick question. Paul Taylor, Friends of Europe. I'm working on transatlantic defense industry cooperation. And I want my question is really for the two entrepreneurs. I get the feeling from everybody that I talk to that we are tying ourselves in knots in the West. And that our, question, particularly okay. the US transfer of technology and export restrictions uh, are a major showstopper for collaboration between tech businesses uh, and the defense establishment in general. Is that your experience? How much of an issue is ITAR, to name it, for you uh, in your business decisions? And does it need to be made more flexible or perhaps just done away with? Thank you. And the lady in the brown jacket in the front. Um, so nice to meet you. Um, currently doing a master's at King's College London. Um, but my question is that um, NATO Secretary General highlighted earlier the importance of arms control treaties in NATO. I wanted to ask, what do you believe to be the future of arms controls respect um, with lethal autonomous weapons? Do you think that the ban that the United Nations Convention on Conventional Weapons group of governmental experts is working on is the way forward? Or do you believe that a controlled use or a policy of non-use is more realistic? Thank you very much, sir. So who want, maybe we start with the first question, or do you want to start? Yeah, I, I would like to, 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 to answer this first question. On my opinion, this is a little bit too early to, to, uh, to think about arms control regarding these new technologies as we just started our journey in this, uh, in this environment without understanding what kind of, of uh, regulations we, we will need to put in place. Of course, there is a competition. We can be concerned by this competition, but first we need to understand what we really faced. And, uh, and, uh, and, and to do so, we need to explore, investigate, understand in order to identify where are the key issues. I think that data will be one. Uh, we, it is clearly identified. Uh, but um, on my opinion, uh, because also our competitors will not wait for, for us, we need to progress now. Uh, and not slow down uh, our, uh, this uh, exploration and uh, investigation. Um, that's only my, my, my recommendation at that time. Let's, do you want to take that yeah, one? One more point I'll add just more broadly, yeah. which is I think it's a natural human reaction that technologists and politicians and military people alike all need to accept that everything we're talking about is very scary. There are lots of terrifying new technologies that, even as a technologist, I don't really understand that well. I mean, I'm in simulation and AI, but I look at what's happening with um, modern approaches to CRISPR, and I'm much more terrified of that than I am of AI, right? Um, it's natural to then want to control and to want to restrict. I think the problem is 
We just don't know where this rabbit hole goes yet. We don't fully understand these technologies or what their parameters are of constraint. Is, does it, is it really even meaningful to export restrict AI? How do you export restrict an algorithm or a technique you know, that doesn't really make sense? So I think a more liberal approach today is probably wisest because we need to see where these technologies go and where they develop, and then we can always come to those questions later. Let's take the first gentleman's question. What do you think about flexibility? So in, in our space, for instance, so cybersecurity is a very, let's say, regulated framework in that respect. So it is true that uh, it, from a commercial standpoint, even also the export control is, is, a, is, is something to take into account when partnering with, with certain institutions. That is something that, you know, you, you really have to take care of. But I think it's also an opportunity to, for for. for startups that we can be very quick and adapt fast and integrate new methods to bring them to bring this value down to an organization that is structured and that have the potential to get to those many use cases for our society and for that organization to get all of these quick changes. So I think that the point with cybersecurity in particular is that I don't think it makes sense to talk about cybersecurity for the military or for the civilians, right? So it has to be everywhere. So basically it's, it's a no-brainer that we need to learn to work together and deploy it for everyone. We have time for one more question, very quickly. Can we take it from the gentleman at the back? Hello, my name is Mohamed El Sayer. I'm a student uh, at King's and scholar of the Foreign Office, Chevening Scholar. So given the ongoing debate at, uh, regarding the hypersonic uh, missiles, I just would like to know, uh, should we expect a, a similar program, a joint program, comprehensive a hypersonic missiles program uh, from NATO or not? Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, NATO do not own uh, military capabilities except some common funded capabilities dealing with common and control logistics uh, and, uh, uh, and infrastructures and so on. So these hypersonic uh, devices are mainly developed are not mainly are only developed by the by the nations. Uh, what what NATO brings to the to the table is uh, trying to coordinate all these developments into a, mili a, a common military instrument of power in order to keep the edge. That that's only our uh, our role. And so but we do not develop at the NATO level uh, any hypersonic programs. So let me try and wrap this up because we are running out of time um, and try and get a nugget from each one of you um, when it comes down to this new kind of arms race, which is now a, a thought race, a data race, uh, a technology race. What is it in one line that you think your tech, your organizations can contribute in ensuring the safety of the very folks that you service? So I think deploying a communication system that is future proven safe, so that gives us the freedom to, to keep exchanging information online. And this will give us the freedom to exploit all of these AI quantum computing capabilities from a secure standpoint. Better decision making. Can't be shorter than that. Thank you, Herman. Um, I would like to thank you for these uh, two teams uh, which have been chosen uh, for this uh, round uh, for this round table. Uh, uh, from hypersonic to uh, AI, it shows a spectrum we have to embrace, which is very large, and the ch uh, challenge is there. But uh, I I'm very confident on uh, on. Uh, on the success uh, for, for us because uh, we own at 29 nations the best technological and industrial base, the best skills, the largest uh, investments capability, so we will succeed. It is a question of data. Data will be key. Uh, data sharing, data policy. It is a question of adaptation and speed of adaptation. And Carlos has your card, General. Thank you so very much for that. Please say thank you to this wonderful panel. Um, Herman, General Donata, and Carlos, thank you. Fascinating panel. Ending on a sobering note to reflect on the fact that European government spending on research and development, about 1% of total European defence spending, is at the lowest level in almost 10 years, uh, which in a way highlights the importance of the investments and the work being done in the private sector, a conversation that's happening in the United States, uh, a conversation that's happening in Europe as to how uh, cutting-edge work being done in the private sector can mesh with government. This is going to be an increasingly important issue for the Alliance over the next decade. 
just as AI and hypersonic missiles and issues like that would not have been on the agenda of a meeting like this 15 years ago in the prominent way they are today, similarly, climate change would not have occupied the sort of central position that it does in the thinking of future security issues. So the next section is going to touch on how NATO needs to be thinking about this, extending the theme of the next 10 years rather than just focusing on debates uh, to do with Syria or Russia or the short term. So for our next spotlight presentation, please join me in welcoming to the stage the Director Emeritus of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Hans Joachim Schallmüller. Thank you. not going to talk about uh -huh, two percent but two degrees actually yeah? there is in parallel now the conference in Mad Madrid on global warming so NATO has been around for 70 years now in order to keep the world safe but we have to ask what type of world will it be in 30 40 50 years from now and uh, when you think about global warming, resource depletion, pollution of the oceans, the air, when this is quite a challenge, actually, I'll refer to that slide behind me a little bit later. But uh, since this is an interactive forum, let me ask you two questions. Who here in the audience thinks, and raise your arms, that you are better off today than your grandparents were? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a big showing. And who thinks that your grandchildren will be better off than you today? Very few, actually. And this is telling you a, a big story, actually, yeah? because somehow we think we are the golden generation or the golden generations who actually live at the peak of human civilization. But human civilization is really a threat because of global warming. So behind me, there is this slide. We published a paper last week, actually. It's a coincidence in Nature, the leading science journal on the so-called climate emergency. And if you think global warming is something which is coming in an incremental way, you know, smoothly we can adapt to it over hundreds of years, what you see behind me is a cartoon. These are the vital organs of the planet, if you like. Uh, if global warming keeps on going, one degree, two degrees, four degrees, when some of these vital parts of the Earth system, we call them tipping elements or tipping points, will be pushed into a new mode of operation. Greenland ice sheet may melt down, seven meter sea level rise. The Indian summer monsoon, if it falters, it will affect 800 million people. And the Gulf Stream, if it is shut down, and that happened many times in the history of this planet, it will change the climate of Europe. So I'll show you how the scientific evidence has changed over the years. So next slide, please. Oh, actually, I can do it myself. It's even better, you see. Very interactive. This is the paper I all advise you to read. It's uh, easy reading, but very scary in a way. And what we have shown there is the scientific assessment, the IPCC. So on the left-hand side, you have in 2001, when do we think that these tipping points will be transgressed? And you see, it's only when the dark red actually shows up. So between five and six degrees warming, we thought this would happen. When you go through the years 2007, 2013, and finally 2018, so the last IPCC report, and now you see the danger zone has come down to between one and two degrees. So it's precisely the Paris Agreement. Uh, and if we keep on doing research, it might be even worse. What is even worse and what is really risky is that these tipping points might interact to bring about something like a runaway greenhouse effect, or maybe a global tipping point, and we might be pushed into a hothouse earth with five, six, or eight degrees warming. Uh. 
actually very interesting because the Norwegian Prime Minister will follow me this cascade of tipping points and hothouse earth dynamics starts in the Arctic. So the jet stream may be weakened because of ice melting. Finally, you will have fires across the Arctic Circle, Siberia, Alaska, as we have seen this year, by the way, Scandinavia. And this will affect the permafrost and will release methane and CO2 and so on. So if there is such a vicious circle, it will start in the Arctic. We have to take good care of it. Now let me end with, with one idea, which is very important. If we really want to confine global warming to less than two degrees, and this is a hell of a job, when we have to decarbonize global industry during the next 30 years, that's a tall order clearly. But this will change the geostrategic balance of powers. Think of Russia, for example. In the morning, everybody talked about Russia. But Russia, without oil and gas to sell, will be a different state, of course. Eh? While China will rise anyway, they are not based on oil and gas. They invest heavily in renewables, and in the end, they are based on brain power. So we will have a different strategy on this planet. So I could talk for hours, of course, and I know you would be very eager to listen, but I will drag the way from the stage now, and I thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome to the stage Vice Chairman of the Munich Security Conference, Ambassador Boris Ruger. Good afternoon. Um, the Munich Security Conference is very proud to be part of NATO Engages. Uh, we've worked very hard with our partners, the names of which you can see behind me, uh, to make this event happen. We're delighted to have you here, um, great speakers and a great audience. Uh, Professor Schellenhuber just gave us a sobering uh, presentation, not unlike the one he gave at the Munich Security Conference 10 months ago. And um, we at the Munich Security Conference believe very strongly that climate change must be addressed as a security issue. Um, and that is why we're pleased to have it on the agenda today. And, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Prime Minister Erna Solberg of Norway, and uh, I would like all of you to welcome the Prime Minister. Thank you for being with us, Prime Minister. It's Thank a, you. It's a Thank real privilege to have you. You've been Prime Minister since 2013, and yes. um, climate issues and issues of sustainability have been uh, important topics for you. So it's, it's great to have you here. Before we turn to, to climate, um, I would like to ask you very briefly, um, what is it that you're looking for from the leaders' meeting tomorrow? Well, first of all, I think... Um we are here to celebrate 70 years of uh, cooperation over the Atlantic for security, for peace. And I suppose that our biggest aim was to have to remember that through the meeting, that we have had 70 years of securing this. And that even if we have discussions up and down on, on single issues, there still is a very fundamental, uh, I think, trust that we can deliver on security for all member countries. And I think that's the most important thing that we've been working on the last six years, in fact, in, in this alliance. Thank you. Now, turning to climate, you and I were listening to yeah. uh, the professor's presentation just now. Um, and as somebody who has thought about these issues and engaged um, on them in many different fora, I'd like to ask you for your reaction to what the professor had to tell us. Well, I think this is among the issues that we have to start to discuss closer on security issues too. What will climate change, the heating of the world mean for insecurity, for different changes, what not new types of challenges? And, and some of them are not new. I mean, we now have a 
critical discussion in, in a critical situation in Mali, Burkina Faso. We have had extremism rising, but also uh, some of this is, uh, is fueled by lack of water and that you get the herders to move into the areas where the farmers are, and then you'll end up in a conflict because the movement of people, climate change makes people move, and it changes and it creates new uh, security threats in areas. It will change economies, and I think that is also a big uh, aspect of it, and it will change sea routes and all of this that is also implicated by the Arctic. Uh, just before uh, this weekend, there was a um, new story in Norway saying that um, the temperature is on average since 1961, that's the year I was born, so through my lifetime, has increased by 0 0.9 degrees. In Oslo, it has increased by 2 degrees. In the Arctic, by 5.6 degrees. It's twice as fast than the mainland and even more faster than the average, the changes that we're seeing. And that will change the structures. And, and what we have to do is to see what will be the security implications of those change structures. So when we think of climate change in NATO, it's something that perhaps people usually don't think of as, as connected. How would you see NATO's role? It's primarily, in a sense, a matter of adaptation. How do we deal with the fallout of climate change. Um, you talked about um, uh, the southern neighborhood of NATO, um, migration, um, and the impact that can have on our security. You also mentioned the Arctic, and perhaps we can explore that a little more. But is NATO's role to, to deal with the fallout? I think NATO's role is to make sure that they analyze the root causes for changes in security in different areas. I mentioned Mali, Iraq is also a very difficult issue when it comes to, to water supply. The whole Middle East has a water problem for the future and it will lead to more conflicts in, in, the, in these areas. And that's understanding what happens means that you learn more about security. I don't think we will solve this by our defense part of NATO, but on the political part, it might also give rise to a little bit more of discussion on how important is it to stop the change, because that's what we really have to do, is to stop the climate change, is to make sure that we invest now instead of having to really invest a lot in the future to, to, to work on the damages. It's much, it's much less costly to prevent climate change than it will be to adapt to it, and, and on all levels of our society. So I think it's for the political side more, more than for the military side of it. But of course, it has to be part of the analysis that you, okay. that you see where the new threats are and, and what will happen because of that. Right. My, my sense, and I, I could be wrong, is that one thing that NATO can bring to this is precisely the analytical side, the assessment side. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, at the beginning of this year, the U.S. Department of Defense issued a study on the impact of climate change on U.S. military installations mm -hmm. um, and the operational impact that has. So my sense is that if military people write these things up mm -hmm. with the credibility they have and say there's real-life consequences of this, it's not just an environmental issue, mm -hmm. um, it's not just something that tree huggers care about, we as military people see an impact, it undermines our security. Do you think that would that that political leaders, mm -hmm. heads of state and government, ministers will take note if, if that analysis comes out of the NATO system? Yes, and understanding that uh, insecurity is the worst thing for security. I mean, when things change just too much, mm -hmm. it's difficult to plan, it's difficult to know how to deal with it. It's, uh, you know, you have to rethink a lot of the strategies that you have. And, and climate change is the big insecurity created these days because it will will and when you have more people i mean uh, in africa you know migration is the big issue for europe underlying this climate change will lead to more migration it will lead to more conflicts it will lead to less sustainable development mm -hmm. in uh, all of the african continent even though you know on the soft power side the european union is trying to work together with other countries to create more development in these, in these countries to stop the migration waves. So I think understanding this and see how that fuels extremism. Mm -hmm. Because 
One thing is, of course, that there will be a hotspot and conflict between countries, but it fuels extremism, and extremism is global. Yeah. It's not local anymore. Yeah. It will have global effects. Now, the Arctic is, is an area of particular interest mm -hmm. to Norway. Can you talk a little bit about how climate change has already impacted and what that means for Norwegian security? Well, what we see in the Arctic, of course, is that the, the uh, uh, ice cap is moving further north. Mm -hmm. It means that you will have the sea roads uh, opened in the north that will be open because it's ice-free, but not open security-wise. I mean, if you're going from Europe to China by the North Passage, I mean, it's, you go by Russia all the way, and it still is costly. It's going to be difficult to to um, have uh, um, insurance on your, on your trade. So we don't really see that much happening. We discuss it more than what really is happening these days because of, of costs on that. What we do see is that it increases economic activity in those areas. It increases, it increases fisheries, tourism. So we don't really look upon the challenges in the Arctic at these days as, as new security issues, the new things are in fact safety issues. Mm -hmm. It's about rescue, it's about safety, it's about making sure that you can search and rescue people who are there. Uh, I mean, a big, uh, a big cruise ship uh, having problems in, in, in the Arctic area is going to be a very challenging uh, thing. So we have to think through all of these things. Mm -hmm. But the Arctic has always been an area for Russian operations. They have been testing their military equipment there all the time. It's, it's not a new thing, the, the, the military activity. The, the new thing is that the civil activity is increasing in these areas and leads to those of us who are countries who have responsibility in those areas, who have economic zones. We have to uh, plan more for what we are doing and probably have to regulate more what we are doing in these areas. Um, earlier in the day, we had Secretary General Stoltenberg here, fellow Norwegian, mm. and um, he spoke about the Arctic as well, and he said China was also active in the Arctic. Mm. And perhaps um, we can turn to China for just one second, um, because um, it appears that China will be part of the discussion mm. among leaders tomorrow. Um, and China is seen as the great power competitor, the rising power, um, extending its influence beyond Asia in a number of ways. Mm. So it's a competitor on the one hand, but when we look to the issue of climate change, uh, it's obvious that we will not get a handle on mm. climate change unless we find some way of bringing China on board, cooperating with China, using Chinese, uh, the Chinese potential for innovation. Can you, can you describe how you see China if you look at it from this meeting and, and also with regard to climate change? Well, in the view of climate change, we will not solve the issues without having the big emitters on board. I said that in Madrid when the, when the COP opened yesterday. We need to have the big emitters on board and they need to have stronger national uh, targets the next year. They have to do that. And China is one of them. Uh, the US is one of them, which we would hope for getting back into the climate discussions again. And, but all of the big emitters have to participate in that because they're still opening new coal mines uh, to fuel the, uh, the energy need of, of China. So uh, we can do a lot in other countries, but if not China is not on board, it will be difficult. And I, I believe that the Chinese are thinking seriously about this. Among the re one of the reasons is, of course, because of the congestion in their, and, and, and the air pollution in their own cities. It's, it's harming the health of Chinese people. So there's a mixture of uh, reasons, but I, I think they're on board with this. Um, when it comes to the economic activity of, of China, of course, they are innovative. They are, uh, all our businesses are working closely with them on different issues. It's a big market, but it's also a big uh, technology uh, developer these days. And I think there is a need to drag China into this international organization, through the multilateral organization, and work together with them, both on climate change, but also on all of the other issues that leads to to uh, lowering tensions in the world. When it comes to the Arctic, I think what we mainly see now uh, from our side is that the Chinese in their research work on research and polar research is very interested in the Arctic. 
And it's important to remember that the Earth's orbit is the shortest okay. in, <laughs> on the poles. That means that if you're looking at what happens in space uh, and satellites, this is also an important issue for a lot of countries to be active in that area. And, of course, they are on oil and gas. Thank you, Prime Minister. Now, we have um, a short seven minutes left, and I want to bring in the audience. Um, and specifically, I'd like to discriminate against all who are older than 35 years. <laughs> um, so if we can have some under 35 sticking up their hands with questions. And do we have a mic somewhere? I'm looking. Um, so we have one question right here. And I'd like to take two or three questions in a row. Um, I have two from Sarah. No, that's, yeah, that's right. Please. Hello, my name is uh, Richard Griese. Um, I'm from the University of Munich. And my question to the Prime Minister is uh, what role uh, Svalbard, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is going to play in the Arctic and what, how Norway is going to act as, uh, as a possibly a broker or a, um, an actor in the struggle over the Arctic. Thank you. Two more questions, under 35s. There's one over there. Uh, my name is Connor and I'm a student at the University of Glasgow. Um, we're seeing a rising movement of young people about climate change, but the political leaders don't seem to be reflecting the urgent need to act on it. Do we need to see our political leaders take action and kind of bring some uncomfortable truths and uncomfortable laws to society to make us change? Because at the moment, we don't seem to be doing it by choice and for our actions. So that's my question. And we have Hello, my name is Ekaterina and I'm part of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, the, uh, our youth organization. So our organization and the seniors and the younger ones have been working on the Bulgarian presence on the Antarctic. And we will be happy to also cooperate with Norway on that um, issue. But um, for that reason, we will be happy also Norway to open its embassy in Sofia and not to be raging. Um, a, an embassy in Sofia is your question. Okay, then I'd like one more question. There's another young lady here. Pass on the mic. And, and if you could keep the questions to the point, please. Okay, hello, I'm Sofia. I'm from Yata, Portugal. Being that Norway, Norway is a role model regarding a total defense system, how can you apply some measures to, to tackle or to respond to climate change uh, challenges? Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister. Now, first of all, let me start by Ar the Arctic. There is, no, there is no battle over the Arctic. The Arctic is a well-regulated area. It's regulated by the law of the sea, and there is a, a UN commission that decides on where the economic zones go. So those who believe that this is a wilderness place where there's no, uh, no um, law that applies, there are laws and there are caretakers, and nine countries are the main caretakers in the Arctic Council. So it's important to say that this is not a free zone for, for people to do activity. It's on the national uh, authority, and it's... Uh, uh, it's well. we, we, and Svalbard is part of the Norwegian, uh, uh, of Norway, it has a special treaty around it, but it's a part of our country, and uh, what we do there is that we try, first of all, most of this is vulnerable nature, so a lot of it is, is, uh, is, reg uh, is regulated because of the nature that's there. Uh, but we are working a lot on, on um, uh, cooperation when it comes to research, there is large international community of researchers there and of course there is a bit of tourism a little bit too much maybe but we are now trying to look at how we can make sure that it doesn't uh, um, it doesn't become too much for, for the nature and the caretaking of, of uh, the Arctic area but there is a well regulated system for all of this uh, the challenge is of course as I said is on, on the safety issues because when there are more tourists more boats it's difficult, you know. We have a small hospital. We have, uh, we have some transportation means, but we cannot rescue a whole cruise line up there if something really goes wrong. It's, it's going to be, be quite difficult. Uh, if we are too comfortable, we as world leaders, I, 
I, I think that depends on who are the leaders that are, uh, are facing climate change. I believe, and I, I sincerely believe that there is a big responsibility that most uh, national leaders feel today. But there is also a problem between the short change, the short-sightedness in politics and the long sights. Uh, and it's difficult to get the compromise. And I was in a panel in Madrid yesterday talking about just transition. And that's the big and difficult issue because there will be countries losing jobs. If you look at what has happened around in riots the last two, three, four months uh, in different parts of the world, it's one of the guidelines in, in the work against climate change that people are trying to, to follow up is to cut uh, cut. Uh, petrol and, and oil subsidies in countries, and it leads to street riots. Um, maybe not only because of that. There's probably a lot of other reasons why the riots come. But it says that it's difficult to do that type of structural changes without, uh, without really having a public uh, support for it. That's why it's imp important to engage. It's important to discuss. It's important to get people to understand. And it's important for all of us politicians to understand that we can't just take, let a part of our society take the cost. For example, by losing their jobs or by getting much more costs because we are putting in, in, uh, in policies that are, are, uh, are hurting some parts of it. Even in my country, I have to admit, we have a discussion on, we have a very extensive electrical car policy. The ones who buy new cars and expensive new electrical cars are quite well off compared to those who... Uh, would buy their first car, and it would be a 10-year-old car, and they would not get an electrical car by that. So it's, uh, it's sometimes the, in, uh, the, um, um, the social distribution of, of connected to it is, is difficult. Um, I am, well, we, we try to be very good at working together with Bulgaria, even though we do not have an embassy there. Sometimes we have to run efficiently also our foreign services. And I think the total defense system is an important part of, of working also against, the, you know, changes. Uh, uh, and especially on the, when we are adapting to the more challenging weather systems that you have, that we will get by, with, with the climate change, our total defense system is an important part of it because the civil defense systems have to be increased, I think, in most countries because you get more flooding, avalanches, and all of that. And I think my time is up. And our yes. time is up, Prime Minister. Thank you very, very much for being here. We could go on for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome to the stage the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Joanna. Uh, I'm coming from the stairs uh, and I was wondering if we are performing today a Romanian, Romanians Got Talent show. Is that the case? Or, wheels of fortune, this gets closer a little bit. The Apprentice. I'm coming from Romania. And I was lucky enough to be the first Deputy Secretary General of NATO representing a new ally. A region, my country, Millions and millions and millions and millions of Europeans who have been separated from our natural family by communism. Who would have imagined that 30 years our region will be a fully fledged part of the Western world? Members of NATO, members of the EU. Sometimes I think I'm living a dream. As a young Romanian, trying to apply every summer for a visa to get out and see the West. You know what I've got every summer? A postcard in an indistinguishable color. 
I think it also had a bad smell. A postcard from the Securitate saying, your visa request has been approved. It was printed negatively. Year after year after year, not allowing young Romanians, Bulgarians, Poles, Baltic countries, Czechs, Slovaks, and so many others to do things that for our Western friends and colleagues and allies now seems to be the normal thing to do. It was not a done deal that NATO would enlarge. No, no, no. There was a big hesitation. And I have to thank, as a Romanian, two incredibly important leaders like Václav Havel, Oleg Valenza, because they also made the moral, not only the strategic argument for why should we reunify Europe? Why should we give back to the generations of Europeans who have been denied the blessing of freedom? The divine right to choose your leaders. It was the right thing to do. NATO enlarged 20 years ago with the first countries, 15 years ago, Solomon Passi, this guy with the red sneakers here. We were crying together in the old headquarters of NATO as foreign ministers of Bulgaria and Romania. He gave us a trabant as a gift. If you visit the headquarters, you'll see a nice trabant, NATO 04, that's Solomon. When our countries, together with other seven nations, were welcomed as new members. I even have my signature on the European failed constitution. I'm just saying that what we are bringing to this alliance of ours, to this Western institution of ours, is a sense of intense urgency for us to continue to stay relevant, to stay true to our values, not to be deterred by the world which is changing so rapidly. A Romanian as a Deputy Secretary General of NATO. That's a good one. I remember also having an intense provincial complex. After receiving the beautiful bad smelling cards from the Securitate that I was not allowed to travel, my first big experience in the West was going to the ENA, École Nationale d'Administration, Mont General. A great school. I remember I was scared to death because I thought that I would not be up to the job. But yes, I was, and yes, we are, and yes, we will be. So when someone comes to us and tells us, choose between Europe and America, I'll say we cannot do that because Europe and North America were the two sides of the same coin. Don't make us choose because we always choose security. Because we have in our history, in our geography, in the part of Europe I represent, a very, very narrow sense of survival. We have a very narrow sense of survival. There's no way in which the West should give up the fight. Because the fight is not only my young friends, my younger friends, and I'm speaking to you because you'll be the leaders of our societies. You'll be the ones who will be leading. Irrespective how much economic, technological, or vagaries of history will be on your shoulders as future leaders of the world, Remember, there is one thing that makes the difference is the values we share. Never doubt of our values. Never doubt of the values of freedom. Never doubt of the values of democracy. Never value doubt of the values of an open society. But your fight 
If my fight as a generation is to reunite Europe, or as the fight of the founding fathers of the alliance was basically not to repeat the devastating wars that destroyed Europe and the world in the 20th century. And I think what Article 5 says was what Thomas Jefferson said at the inception of the American experiment. If we have that quote, I will quote it. If not, I still have a provincial complex. But look, look at there. That was Thomas Jefferson saying, I have but one system of ethics for men and for nations. There's not a different set of ethics for men and women and for nations. This is the difference between democracies and authoritarian regimes. To be grateful, to be faithful to all engagements and under all circumstances. This is Article 5, my friends. To be faithful to our engagements, no matter what. And there is something that I will beg you to do. When you will be in positions like these, continue to innovate. Democracy and freedom are not things that cannot, will not survive if you don't invest and innovate. NATO is innovating, European Union is innovating, you should continue to innovate. 30 years ago, in the streets of Bucharest and Timisoara, in the only bloody revolution in all former communist countries, in my country, young people like yourselves and like myself, they took out a big hole from the national flag of Romania, just as a symbol of separation from the incredible tough past. To that hole, we imagined a future. To that hole, we wanted to catch up with a historical lost time. History is impatient with us. History will give us and will give you, the younger generation, so many hurdles and so many challenges. Never doubt of yourselves. Never doubt of our values. Fight for democracy. Fight for freedom. Fight for our shared values. And we'll have another 500 years. Not 70 more years, but hundreds of years of things like we have to do today. Embrace and cherish freedom, my friends. This is the message which comes from a difficult part of Europe. And I'm here to serve the greatest alliance, not only the history of mankind, but an alliance that will shape the future for many generations to come. Salute and God bless you all. Ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome to the stage Honorary Chairman of Globsec, Ambassador Ratislav Kalcha. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and very pleased to uh, greet you all on behalf of Globsec, uh, one of the members of this fantastic consortium running this event. Uh, Globsec is a leading think tank in Central Europe and uh, the organizer of uh, many events down there and partnering on events like this all around the world. I see in the room a lot of familiar faces who come to our strategy forum in Spring or Tatra Summit in the autumn, and it's very nice to see you all here. Um, we are getting to the point to get uh, on the stage two important prime ministers and look into whether 70 years of NATO is a reason to celebrate or remind ourselves where we are. We were already told 70 years in human life is enough. Uh, and we look back uh, and, and, you know, well, you know, there are still a lot of plans, uh, new 40, as we heard. Uh, 
There are those who say um, NATO is an organization, it's a dinosaur, who should have been gone already by the explosion or implosion caused by the Berlin Wall. There are those who even today would say NATO is a brain death because it cannot cope with the challenges and shouldn't be here or should change some substantial in the way that we've gone. There are those like me who are true believers in NATO. And I was opening NATO office in, uh, 25 years ago, Slovakia, and I still believe committed, I'm still committed to, the, to its vision, and I think there is a purpose. And this is a success story. However, 70 years of any type of success doesn't guarantee that in the upcoming years we will be fit to survive this Darwinistic survival fight. We need the old capabilities. When you would look at the Article 5, it says armed attack. Today we look at the things in security where armed attack, okay, you know, it's still a risk. But there are many other things which can come in our face and are threatening our security. So, two prime ministers, I'd like them welcome, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like you to welcome them on the stage to say, to, think, to see how fit we are, how willing we are to commit ourselves to the old principle of Musketeer, one for all, all for one. And what are our capabilities and how are we going to survive this Darwinistic fight, which is spinning faster and faster. Let me welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Debra is our moderator and prime minister of Canada and the Netherlands on the stage. So, really warm welcome to Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Ruta. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. The timing is quite tight. And then I'll open it up to the audience for questions. We're looking, hopefully, for younger members of the audience, under 35, to answer, ask some questions if that's possible. Um, so, gentlemen, you're here to mark the Alliance's 70th anniversary. How do you see the future for NATO? Does it even have a future? Will it be here in 70 years' time? I'm convinced it will be there in 70 years' time. It is the strongest, most powerful defence organisation in world history. Uh, it's crucial for the safety of Europe, but it's also crucial for the safety of Canada and the US. Uh, because it is very important that this part of the world stays stable, but also that Canada and the US know that they have partners here on the European side anchored in that relationship, uh, be it on the defence side, uh, but of course also broader in the, in the, on the other political issues. So I'm absolutely convinced this is there to stay. NATO is there to stay. But I think we recognize that, of course, the world has changed over 70 years. And it hasn't just suddenly changed now after 69 years of being the same. Uh, it has always evolved and has always uh, seen new challenges come up and new configurations come forward. And we've adjusted and adapted and stayed true to the original values that brought us together. I mean, uh, uh, Canada shares a history with the Netherlands in, in the liberation after, uh, after World War II that uh, brought us together and has us looking at the world in a very similar way. And throughout the NATO alliance, yes, you have different people coming from different places, uh, but the way we look at the very real security challenges we're facing now and the way we know we can overcome them uh, means that the, I think the, the future for this alliance is bright. Prime Minister Trudeau, what do you think is the biggest threat to NATO? Is it internal infighting or is it an external threat? And if the latter, is it terrorism? <laughs> Russia, China, or something else? Well, I, I know that's uh, such a, a, a journalistic question that, that everyone's... Is the internal oh. threats bigger than the external threats? Uh, you know, NATO has survived for 70 years because we've always had frank, real conversations. There have been disagreements that we've worked through. There have been differences in perspective, differences in, in priorities uh, that have ended up with a more resilient, more flexible, more agile organization that has adapted to uh, the times we've had. Now, uh, yes, you've listed a number of the threats uh, that are out there. We're in, in uh, a transforming global circumstances right now uh, where poles of power are shifting, uh, where citizens are really anxious about their own futures, about what the world's going to look like for their kids. And institutions like NATO that are actually tackling these 
complex problems in sophisticated and nuanced ways are really, really important, and that's what we're going to keep doing. And Prime Minister Rutte, Donald Trump this morning has come out and said that President Macron was disrespectful when he described NATO as experiencing brain death. Is President Trump correct, or does President Macron have a point? That's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> you asked him. And, 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 here, him. <laughs> and here I believe you need a nuanced answer. Uh, I, I do think uh, that Emmanuel Macron made some valid points in his Economist article where he talked about uh, the need for Europe to step up, uh, for the need for Europe and the US and Canada to stay engaged. I remember all the discussions we both had with uh, President Obama about his pivot to Asia, and I was always trying to convince him that he can be more successful in that pivot if he would work together with Europe. And then, then collectively uh, we would have that pivot towards Asia and not just uh, the American side. Um, so there are a few issues which uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, rightly addressed. Uh, I was not in agreement with his assessment of brain debt. Uh, I thought that was taking this whole thing a step too far. So I didn't uh, agree with that particular uh, way of expressing it. But I do acknowledge that there are a few issues we have to discuss. And this goes back to what Justin was just saying. This is an organization of fundamentally democratic countries. That means that we can differ. We can have differences of opinion. The, the worst thing we can do is not to discuss them, because that will be the end of NATO. The fact that we are able to sit together now for two days and hammer out these issues and then come to collective agreements is the best proof that this alliance will stay there for the next 70 years. And this is the big difference between some of the more autocratic systems in the rest of the world and what makes us different from them. It makes and us strong. Do you both therefore agree with the idea of this wise group uh, these group of wise experts that France and Germany separately have suggested to talk about the future purpose of NATO over the next two years? Oh, I, I, I don't think you survive 70 years as an alliance without uh, regularly reflecting on uh, what is the best way for us to help. Where are the strategic priorities? What is it that we need to do together to have the best impact, not just on our members, but on, on the world itself? I think it's, it's, a, it's great that we're going to be doing a, a reflection about uh, how we can, you know, respond and and you know, lead uh, in uh, in complicated times then it's crucial i completely agree it is crucial that we agree beforehand that some of the fundamentals are not at stake for example this one for all and all for one idea article 5 uh, that that is still the cornerstone and through this reflection will stay as the cornerstone of nato that is uh, crucial at the same time we have so many issues to discuss how to deal with russia pressure and dialogue how to deal with china uh, which is presenting lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities. How to uh, deal with the issue of space, so that next to air, sea, land and cyber, we have this fifth dimension, and how to deal with that, how to deal with new technologies. So there are many issues. Which cyber, uh, terrorism. Cyber, uh, terrorism, so these, these all uh, require a fundamental rethink, uh, without losing the cornerstones of NATO. They have to stay there. And a final question from me for both of you. Um, both your countries are falling way behind on the 2% target for defence spending. It's that ready. I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when will you both individually, when will your countries meet that target, bearing in mind that 2024 aim that people are going towards? And also, can you just explain to people, how do you look Donald Trump in the face, given, given what he's been saying and how much he's been berating allies for not meeting that minimum threshold? When... When my government first got elected in 2015, we took a hard look at how Canada can best help in the world. Uh, and that is the frame that, that we took. We talked about Canada being back, and we knew that investments in defense was going to be an essential part of it. The previous government had cut defense spending, and we, knew we needed to do more. I've got my uh, defense minister, Harjit Sajjan, and our foreign minister, François-Philippe Champagne, qui sont ici. Um, and we came together as a team, and we said, okay, we need to spend more on defense. We're spending 70% more on defense over these 10 years. That means stepping up uh, in purchasing massive uh, upgrades to our ships, to our, uh, to our new, uh, new fighter jet fleets. It means uh, leading a battle group in Latvia on the eastern front of NATO that Canada's taken on. We're now leading the uh, mission in Baghdad, the NATO training mission there. We're, uh, we're engaged in substantive ways, but also ways that reflect our leadership. Three of our top NATO leaders that are Canadians are 
are actually women, incredibly qualified women, both in, in Rome, in the maritime fleet, and leading in Iraq. This is, this, these are the kinds of things that Canada does by stepping up. Yes, uh, we're going to continually invest more, but we're going to do it in a way that is right for Canada uh, and right for the alliance. So when will you hit that 2%? We're continuing to move forward and investing in the right way. <laughs> And that is what we will keep saying. Because we, and that's what we'll keep doing. That's exactly what we'll keep doing. And for you? For us, uh, the Welsh pledge was clear. We have to move, to the, we have to move towards 2% by 2024. That's still our aim. We are spending billions and billions more than a couple of years ago. The whole of the alliance outside the US, so the European and Canadian part, are spending 130 billion more now since uh, 2016. There are now nine countries, uh, last year it was only four, now nine countries achieving the 2% uh, target. So in that sense, we are making a lot of progress. Uh, and we will continue investing more over uh, the next years. And there will be elections in 2021 and then a new government. And that will mean, again, uh, I'm absolutely convinced if my party is uh, part of that new government, investing extra money to move towards that target. Uh, we've yeah, we, we pledged ourselves in wills. Do you think you've done enough to satisfy Trump, given his threats to walk away? Um, I, I, I think he, is, uh, uh, he can, he can uh, point at the fact that since he is president of the US, uh, the investments in NATO on the non-US side, so again, Canada, Canada and, and Europe, have come up uh, with this incredible number, uh, this huge number, so that will help. And he is right there. I mean, we cannot uh, have the US uh, shoulder all the burden. And he is completely right when he requires from all of us that we do what we need to do. So, questions from the floor. Young people, oh, uh, lady at the front there with the blonde hair, the second row back, third row back, just there. Thank you. If you could introduce yourself. Yes, uh, Professor Katarzyna Pisarska, I'm the uh, co-founder and director of the Warsaw Security Forum. I, I know the age limit is super strict, so I will not tell my age um, <laughs> and defend myself this way and go straight to the question. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because we talk so much about the defense, the military part of, of NATO, but NATO is also about values. How worried uh, are both of you, uh, coming from Canada and the Netherlands, about the democratic <coughs> recession that we see throughout uh, not only Europe but the Western world? Well, of course, this is also an issue which is, uh, we are dealing with within the European Union, which is also a community of values uh, as NATO is. So uh, we do have some thorough debates uh, within the EU uh, about the state of play uh, in some of our uh, member states in terms of uh, uh, what it means in terms of democracy, uh, rule of law, independent judiciary, independent uh, press. Uh, and all of these are crucial uh, for a rich, diverse uh, democracy we want to have. Um, so I think um, uh, Canada and the US are well-functioning democracies. I have no critique there. But on the European side, uh, this is the debate we are having uh, inside the European Union, uh, as well, of course, as in NATO. But I think we, first of all, should deal with this within the EU. Much of the reasons we see backsliding in democratic values and principles, rise of uh, extreme populism, things like that in, in the Western world, uh, is because people are really anxious uh, about the state of the world, about their future. They don't know if they can see their future and their children's future in the way the world is going. And they're uncertain that the institutions that have served our societies, governments, uh, various institutions over the past decades are actually paying attention to the things that will reassure them about the future. So what we have to do is try and allay those fears by showing that we are listening, that we are responding to those concerns, we are empowering people to see themselves in the future, in a transformed future, which you know, through migration, globalization, climate change, you know, security issues, is going to look different than the past. But our ability to come together as an alliance or as various alliances and say these values underpin what we do and we are working really, really hard both to listen and work with you to build a better future, that allays the fears rather than some corners that want to exacerbate and exaggerate those fears. Thank you. And the gentleman over there. Robert Baines, uh, President of the NATO Association of Canada. Uh, this is for Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, Canadians have always seen themselves, certainly for the past 30 or 40 years, and certainly since a certain historic minute, uh, they've seen themselves as peacekeepers, largely. You have poured a tremendous amount of effort uh, in leadership, and specific leadership so, of can you keep your short? NATO missions. 
Uh, I'm interested in how you've changed the story of peacekeeping to just traditional UN engagement to peace through strength with NATO. Well, I, I think you know there is this story that we tell out there, Canadians and others, about Canadians being peacekeepers because we were peaceful people and we, you know, we're polite and we're nice. And we always look for conciliation. I'm sorry, you know, we weren't peaceful. Uh, when we stormed the beaches at D-Day. We weren't peaceful in the trenches of World War I. We stepped up with strength on the world stage and showed that we understand the sacrifices that need to come with protecting our values and creating a better world. And yes, we were very much involved in peacekeeping, uh, UN peacekeeping, uh, but we also know that it is constantly going to be evolving. And being there as UN peacekeepers, as we are, or as we uh, were recently in Mali, uh, being strongly part of NATO missions is also a, a recognition that the world is changing from standing in a line uh, between two opposing armies that will not shoot at each other because you might nick a Canadian. That might have been peacekeeping you know, a few generations ago. Peacekeeping now is a very different thing, and Canada is on the forefront of it with so many of our NATO allies. Um, two questions over there, the lady with the blonde hair and the lady with the brown hair. If you just take them together, one after the other. Great. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, you mentioned the incredible... Can you say who you are? Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Stephanie von Latke, I'm a professor at Queen's University. Uh, you mentioned earlier the contribution that Canada has made uh, with uh, strong female leadership at the helm of, of NATO missions. Um, when you look at the percentage of women in military operations, it's really low for NATO. And Canada has spearheaded an initiative at the UN called the LC Initiative LC, to yes. increase the number of women in military operations. Can the same be done at NATO? And Prime Minister Ruta, would you support that? <laughs> Hello, my name is Mariam Inayat, I'm a student at Newcastle University. I would like to ask why you think it's important for young people like myself to be at an event like this and why we should engage further with NATO. Thank you. Great. Uh, on, on the first issue, yes, more women in uh, military operations, more women in leadership positions uh, in general, but also in military operations, uh, makes for better outcomes. More diversity in general. Uh, makes for better outcomes when you have a whole bunch of people who went to the same school, have the same backgrounds, are the same gender, are the same. You're, you're going to get the same kinds of answers. When you bring in people with a broader range of perspectives, you will get better solutions. It starts with adding women, uh, but there's uh, much more in terms of inclusion that we need to do and that uh, we are pushing on NATO, and I know uh, Mark certainly uh, supports. On, on the second, uh, second element, uh, young people need to know that they can and must actively shape the future by the things they do today. Uh, you're not leaders of tomorrow. You're leaders today, being here today and making sure that this message is getting out to young people who want to see the world change and be a better place uh, and are looking for levers to do it, well, coming out here today is a great piece of it. Watching it online is a great piece of it. I, I, I agree with that. And it is difficult to get more women in senior pol uh, positions in the military. We are working on that, but it is not easy. We have at least had now the last three senior politicians were women, and the present minister and state secretary are women. Uh, but you also want to have more men and women in senior military positions. I also agree with Justin's answer to your question. Uh, I still, uh, to put it a bit negatively, but I still remember the outcome of the referendum here in the UK. And you had all the young people who were shouting this should never have happened. But many of them had not voted. So it is crucial for the younger generation. You are here. I don't have to address you because you are here, so that's great. But it is, in, it is crucial for us as political leaders that the young generation is involved in current affairs, does understand why we need to protect ourselves, why we need forward defense, why we need to be active all over the world to help in countries where our help is needed and we can add something. Because if we cannot support that collectively, uh, then it is very difficult to do that and to keep the political momentum going. So I think the referendum here in 2016 was the best example. And I'm not saying that I had a particular outcome in mind, of course. I should not inf interfere in UK politics. But for me, it was an example that when young people don't go to vote, uh, don't complain afterwards. Uh, but it's not addressed to you because you are here. And, and thank you for that. Thank you. And the gentleman at the front, the second in the front row, Please. And then also there's a lady in the middle with her with glasses on with her hands up. She can come afterwards. 
My name is Vasil Morotnichenko. I come from Ukraine. I have a question for both of the prime ministers. I would like to hear your views on the President Macron's idea about potential rapprochement with Russia. I wonder what do you think about a discussion about potential improvement of relations with Russia, while well, still Russia has to be kept accountable for shooting down MH17, for occupying parts of Ukraine and Georgia. Thank you. Let's take that question first. Oh, we had this discussion uh, around uh, the G7 uh, just in, in Biarritz at the end of, uh, end of August, and the consensus was fairly clear around the table. Uh, well, it wasn't a full consensus, but uh, uh, it was a, a very clear sentiment that we left the table with, which is uh, Russia was excluded from the G8, which became the G7 once again, because of unacceptable behaviors and action, and until Russia clearly demonstrates a willingness to reverse those unacceptable behaviors and behave in very different ways. It'll be very difficult to talk about genuine rapprochement. Uh, we know that the incursion into, into the Donbass, the occupation of Crimea, uh, the way Russia continues to interfere uh, in democratic processes around, uh, around the world, uh, the uh, threat posed, which is why Canadians, we have close to 600 Canadians in Latvia right now uh, as part of the uh, uh, NATO forward presence uh, battle groups, uh, we know that Russia continues to be a significant challenge and we need to understand that Putin responds to strength, not to concessions, uh, and we need to remain strong as an alliance uh, and as allies. And because, uh, uh, yes, I agree. And because of that, the pressure has to be maintained. At the same time, of course, there's room for dialogue. Uh, we cannot just uh, ignore the phone call. Eh? We should still also have that dialogue. But it should start with pressure. Um, um, Crimea, uh, Donbass region, uh, all the uh, examples uh, Justin just mentioned of what Russia is doing internationally. Uh, and that is running against what is acceptable uh, between countries in this world and how we want to see the world functioning. Uh, so given that, factor, uh, that fact, we have to uh, keep the pressure on. At the same time, of course, there is room for dialogue, but let's not be naive. Uh, this, is, uh, this is difficult. We've got two minutes left. There's a lady there with glasses on who's been waiting patiently. Hi, my name is Carlota and I work for One Young World. First of all, thank you for such an interesting panel and for both of you attending One Young World Summit. And talking about young leaders, because we work with them a lot, is that we're here engaging with the younger generation to address the, the world's most important alliance. But what does that contribution actually look like? And what is it that you ask of us as young leaders when we leave here today? And sorry, when you're answering this question, do you want to give a final thought as well? Well, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for coming and for organizing uh, this event. And you are sitting here the whole day listening to all these presentations and being active in the dialogue. Uh, and that is crucial. Uh, uh, and, and it really it gives a lot of support to all of us on the leader side when we are sitting in that room tomorrow that we are not on our own. So in that sense, that's crucial. And uh, as I said earlier, we cannot function as politicians if um, there is no genuine dialogue about the issues the world is facing, in which young people uh, participate, be it the environment, be it uh, how to fight terrorism, how, to, uh, how not to be naive about our own defense, the, the, the need for an organization like NATO, including, and here we also need your help, the fact that it is a values-based organization, not only a military organization, but also based on values. The Canadians uh, liberated us after the war. So my final thought would be, that I hope you will have influence on as many people as possible around you to also get involved. Uh, and that is what I find crucially important, be it in the Netherlands, be it in Europe, be it in Canada, in the US, that in the Western world, the next generation is involved, is engaged, and does understand that this is not free for all, just nice play. No, this is to the core of who we are and what we want to achieve. To follow up directly from what Mark said, I agree with him entirely. You've got to remember NATO countries and you know these Western countries were democracies. And in order to succeed as democracies, we need engaged, thoughtful citizens that push us in the right directions, ask us the right questions, hold us to account, and aspire to be part of building a better world. It's, it's, it's not just about having the right leader set in all emotions, it's making sure that the voices of citizens are part of the conversation, even at the highest levels, and that people 
individuals and young people specifically are engaged in imagining the future. We know we have to be thinking responsibly, not just about the next four-year mandate, but about the next 40 years. And the decisions we take in order to take that into account need to have young people folding into dialogue. There are so many young people out there who want to change the world, who want to see the world change, but don't necessarily believe that politics or political activism is a very effective way of changing the world. Well, the only people that can change that are voters and citizens themselves deciding to change that. So the more you get engaged in various ways, the more you actually shape the future for the better. We need young people to be involved. We need all citizens to step up, get informed, and be part of the decisions that our countries are taking. Well, thank you ever so much. Applause for that. Um, and voicing concern about cracks in the alliance. I can't think of two better champions for transatlantic defence, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci tout le monde. Merci. You're still able to confirm a lot of ground. Thanks very much, Deborah, for chairing that fantastically well. We have about three minutes before our next storytelling session, uh, and we have some time for reflections from the audience, please. Uh, so we have some mics. If you could just... I think people are reflecting we, to want to, to, want to get out. If we could reflect inside our heads first, <laughs> and then out loud, that would be fantastic. Everyone, sorry, hello. Do you want to give some thoughts first? Yes. Or do you, what, what were your takeaways from those, um, uh, that, that session? I thought that was, it was very interesting to see both Prime Ministers, uh, the consensus on the terms of engagement with Russia. Uh, in the uh, interview that President Macron gave to us, he emphasised the role of counterterrorism cooperation as a potential uh, avenue for dialogue and, and cooperation with Russia. We, we didn't see very much of that there. We haven't seen very much of that this morning. We've still seen uh, the G7 consensus hold. Um, we are now, we have very little time for questions, everyone, so we do want to get to these. So if you could please, if I could see some hands up for reflections from the floor. Excuse me, gentlemen, could you just take your seats, please? Thank you very yeah, much. Sorry, we're just trying to get the audience to engage rather than engaging with each other on the way yes. out. So if you want to leave, obviously head out and have a coffee, but if you'd like to stay, then please... Please, please you... take your conversations to the hallway. We'd appreciate that very much. So has anyone got any, any thoughts they want to share at this point in the day? If you want to stick your hand up, um, we can get a microphone uh, And on you. reflections on any part of the day, including the morning, please, not just a session we've had, ah, on excellent. anything we've Here discussed we so far. Um, <laughs> is that Robert Fox? Yeah, I think Robert Fox has got a reflection. No, we'll no, we'll microphone. No, on a microphone, please. Thank I do apologise. My name is Robert Fox. I'm even older than NATO. <laughs> um, but uh, my wife was liberated by Canadian troops under occupation in the Netherlands, so I do have a small dog in this fight. Deborah, shush, wonderful comparing, but the dog that hasn't barked is what Macron was really driving at. Could the European Defence Union replace, displace, supplement or complement NATO? And that's the question I wanted to ask Mr. Rutter and the Norwegian uh, Prime Minister in particular. Thank I think it's a huge debating point. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. We have a question over there, please. The lady in the scarf. Um, hi, I just want to say how brilliant it is. Oh, I'm Gracie Chick from um, One Life Share It. And I just think it's amazing to have so many young people and young voices here today. It's really encouraging. Um, and just to say, like, the, what the um, two prime ministers were t or the presidents were talking about just then was, um, you know, about bringing people together, about, you know, like, involving everyone in solutions. And I think that's really important. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, I spotted someone over here who I want to hear from, Madeline. Thank you, Deborah. Madeleine Moon, President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Europe is changing, and politically it is increasingly diverse. We see that diversion and variety on a daily basis in the Parliamentary Assembly. It most certainly is not brain dead, but it is challenging. 
So we have new politicians, many of them with no experience in politics, many of them with no experience in defense and security. And we have very experienced people. Is part of the problem with uh, President Macron's view of NATO being brain dead, in fact, that the feedback from assemblies such as ours are not reaching up to the top, where the diversion is different, the diversity is great, and the conversations are great. It's just there's not listening at the top. Thank you for that. We have a uh, very briefly, just over here, please, lady in the red scarf, just here. Thank you very much, and thank you for the wonderful event and discussions today. I'm Beatrice Mosello from Adelphi, a think tank based in Berlin. Um, I was really interested um, at about two points that came out. First of all, the point about inclusion and that strong focus that came very strongly about uh, inclusion of women, but also more generally diversity and in, within decision making in different uh, different levels um, in the security sector that traditionally has not been great on inclusion. And second point. Uh, recognizing climate change and the impact it's going to have on shaping the security challenges going forward, already today, but going forward even more. And it's great to hear climate change being mentioned in a meeting on the NATO. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for all those interventions. Um, we now have another storytelling session. Building on everything we've heard, um, we'll hear from another storyteller with personal experience uh, of a NATO, uh, uh, NATO's actions. Um, to introduce him, please join me in welcoming uh, NATO Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security, Claire Hutchinson. Thank you very much. Hello, hello, hello. Greetings, gentle women and gentle men. It's lovely to see you all here today and lovely to see so many women in the audience, so great. So I'm thrilled to be here to introduce to you the next speaker, a storyteller uh, who has a powerful story of a journey. And for the work that we do in NATO on women, peace and security, the power of the story is very important because quite often in communities where women don't have education, they don't have access or opportunities, the only way they can transmit their information, their stories, their histories, their culture, is by telling stories to the next generation. And so it is that voice, a voice of empowerment that we look to in NATO. But we're flipping it because it is the story of the youth that we're going to listen to today. And the youth voice is also very important to us in NATO. As head of the Human Security Unit, this is some of the work we're looking towards in how we can get the voices of youth and we can listen to them, and listen to them a little bit better. So I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, who will take you through his story, which is the journey of his family. And I think you'll be as thrilled to hear his story as I have been. Because the journey, as you will all know in life, it is the journey that matters and not the destination. So please join me in welcoming our next storyteller, Audi Janjeva. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about what NATO means to me. I'm speaking from the point of view of someone born in this country to Kosovo parents. Now, their generation has an experience, an affiliation with NATO that's of a completely different magnitude to mine. But I can share with you today some stories which show how pieces of my identity have been shaped by the actions of NATO, whether or not I've always realized it. I can shed some light on an upbringing which never failed to make me aware of the very real meanings of words like life, liberty, and freedom. Words which, for me, a lot of the time, are translated in all too abstract and theoretical ways. And that's why I believe it's important on days like today, where NATO opens itself up and welcomes views from across, across the, the societal spectrum, that we can provide some insight into the personal. For me, this means making the voices of millions of Kosovars heard and their appreciation known. 
Because for our people, NATO isn't some abstract entity that meets once a year for a chat and a catch up. NATO is the new roads and bridges built from the rubble, connecting you to the rest of your people. Once you step outside of our family home in Mitrovica, the concrete that you walk on was put there by NATO. NATO is the liberation to go on and pursue an education in your own mother tongue. The reason my parents left Kosovo in the early 1990s was because all Albanian-speaking universities were closed down. NATO is the opportunity for grandchildren to have relationships with their grandparents. My grandparents fled the war in 1999. After the first bombings, after the first NATO bombings on March 24th, they hid for three more days in their house. It is only by what can be described as sheer fortune that on the third day, when my grandfather peered out of his window, spotted by a Serbian sniper, that he wasn't shot there and then. On another day, with another sniper, he would have been. Within two minutes, dozens of soldiers turned up outside their door. And if one stroke of luck wasn't enough, how about a second? One of those soldiers, recognizing two of my granduncles, who were also hiding away at the time, gave them 15 minutes to escape instead of a bullet. After weeks of upheaval in the search for food and shelter, my grandfather being shot in the foot along the way, they found themselves on a bus to Montenegro. After four weeks in Ulcin, they and 200 others boarded a 50 capacity wooden boat sailing for Italy. With Italian soil in sight, the captain stopped the boat and informed the passengers that an unsponsored boat of over 200 people would only be turned away by the Italian authorities. So the captain turned around to the passengers and informed them that he would now be destroying the engines just enough to be able to call for rescue by NATO forces. And so they waited, and so those forces arrived, ensuring safe passage to Italian land. As did my grandparents, arriving here in London some time after, just a week after my second birthday. So you see, I don't believe it's an exaggeration or a cliche to say that NATO means life itself. I will try and end, if I have time, with a small current affairs anecdote, which I think, a, a different kind of anecdote, which I think puts all of this into perspective. On Sunday, the 17th of November this year, the Kosovo national football team hosted England for a game of football. Sporting authorities have a tendency to try and keep politics out of the game, whether it be at World Cups or Olympics. Yet if ever that felt wholly inapplicable, it was that day. Growing up, there was no Kosovo football team to cheer for. I had England, and that was enough, despite all the heartbreak associated with that. But now, I have both. And I know that all the family that were crowded around our TV that Sunday felt the exact same pride. Because in 20 years, going from the brink of wipeout as a people to being part of a sporting family, battling for qualification like dozens of other countries, felt in many ways like an incredible milestone. The welcome that England received over that weekend was unprecedented. It cast my mind back to images that I'd seen after the war in 99 of NATO soldiers being showered with flowers and kisses and people crying at their feet. And fast forward 20 years, and that weekend reflected the fact that Kosovo hasn't forgotten England's role as part of NATO at the end of the last century. With these two contrasting anecdotes, I've tried to show the different faces of war, its aftermath, and NATO's role in that. What is consistent in all war-affected countries is that peace requires a relentless effort from parties all across society so that we, to make sure that we don't forget how easily it can unravel. I've been lucky enough to be born and raised in a country like this, which has given me the opportunity to speak on platforms like these and remind everyone that countries like Kosovo do not forget. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome to the stage technology editor of Politico, Mr. Mark Scott.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's sort of halfway through the afternoon, so I hope everyone has lots of coffee and are uh, ready for a wonderful session with, with the panelists here. So I'm going to go from left to right to introduce them. Uh, to our left, we have Norm Persky, the global public sector lead at Palantir, the, uh, the tech giant. Uh, to his right, we have Camille Grand, the Assistant Secretary for Defense Investment at NATO. Uh, following on, we have Angela McLean, Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK's MOD. And here to my left, we have Serene Dakaru, Director of the European Satellite Center. So that's, uh, that's it. We're here to talk about tech, R&D, and the future. Wherever you look now, it doesn't need to be just defense. The technology, I mean, it seems a bit um, like a cliche, but it is part of our, all our lives. And AI, big data, and all these topics are going to be coming quite pertinent uh, for, the, for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, Angela, I'm going to turn to you first. There has been a, a supposition that na the NATO countries are the best at this when it comes to tech and R&D, that they, you know, going back to decades, they could, frankly, had the, the, the dominance on the technological side. Frankly, with some of the rise of some of the other global actors, frankly, that can't, isn't really the, the case anymore. At least the NATO dominance is being challenged. How does the coalition uh, the, uh, maintain that level of technological edge, particularly when other actors around the world are investing, frankly, a lot of money in all of this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think one of the things we can do is really terrific technology scanning. So uh, looking out across really our widest innovation uh, environments. So that'll be our own government laboratories, our universities, the big businesses, and of course that whole ecosystem of small and medium-sized enterprises that have been such an engine for innovation recently. So finding new innovations in those arenas and then figuring out really good ways to pull them into use for uh, bolstering the security of, of our people. Uh, some of our governments have been doing this for a long time very well and others of us are learning how to do it. Uh, and I think there's really two important bits of cooperation amongst ourselves there. One is, I think, to learn from each other how to do really great tech scanning and the other is, of course, if one of us finds some really fantastic innovation, uh, something that's good for protecting the security of my people, is good for securing the, the, uh, the security of, of everyone in NATO. Camille, I suppose it all comes down to co cooperation and coordination. Yes, it, um, to Angela's point, you can't just keep it in, in your own silo. You have to work with others to, to bring these, these technologies to the fore. I think that from a NATO perspective, the challenge is a bit twofold. First of all, um, as the Angela was, was pointing at, uh, we are in an environment that is more competitive. Uh, the notion that NATO can take its uh, technological leadership for granted is probably no longer true in certain domains, and we have to sort of really focus to, to make sure that we don't lose a track of that, whether it's in specific technological domains, and we just heard uh, Supreme Allied Manner for Transformation uh, mentioning some of these, but, uh, but also more broadly, uh, what does uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the, the use of data, uh, mean for the alliance? So that's, that's one element, and on that what we're trying to do is uh, to do two things. First of all, uh, internally, make our uh, work uh, uh, more focused on innovation and not lose sight of that. And from that perspective, uh, we have established just in the last few months an innovation board uh, chaired by the Deputy Secretary General and, and a, a small innovation unit which will try to look at what the allies are doing. Uh, this, the, the point about NATO is not uh, NATO suddenly becoming a multi-billion euro organization sp uh, spent on, on, on uh, science and technology, but to really make sure that we work together. And the second thing, which is uh, probably even more important, is how do we leverage everything that is happening within the, the alliance and in the broader sense, in, uh, of course, in our ministries of the defense of all 29 allies, but also in all the universities, the, the tech companies that are there, uh, which is a, a sort of massive untapped potential of, of uh, 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 science and technology that can help NATO stay at the edge, which is really the, the big issue there. And in a way, what was, has been extremely interesting, and I've, I've seen that happening in some of the, the groups I'm chairing, is to see how allies can share their experience. And with one thing that is, I think, fascinating in the, this new environment, which is that some of the smallest allies by size uh, have a lot to bring to the table. This is not, no longer necessarily only a big nation debate. And this is something that has been truly fascinating for me. So, Serene, in your current role looking at, sort of at sort of the, the, the outer space and your previous role at NATO looking at cybersecurity in the cyber, cyber realm, 
does that chime with you? The idea that you know some of the smaller some of the small allies are bringing a lot to the table, and the, the need to cooperate to make this work. I think the cooperation is, is indeed uh, uh, the name of the game, and not uh, just among states. And uh, I agree that with the new technology, that can have what is called uh, equalizing effect. Uh, also, you know, different allies can play significant roles, but also cooperation with the uh, industry. Um, it was uh, mentioned this morning that uh, today's industry that is driving the innovation, not as in the previous century, the government, the, uh, in, uh, the defense sector. So. Um, it's key to, to have such uh, cooperation. I know NATO has uh, industry partnerships, uh, not just on the procurement side, but also on these uh, new technologies. I would also um, highlight that, since you mentioned the two domains, uh, I would say uh, in, in outer space and in cyberspace, on the digital uh, space, uh, one can see a really technological gold rush with huge impact uh, upon everything that happens on on Earth and our societies, but also upon uh, security. And we, 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 we need to have this uh, in mind. On the one hand, um, these spaces are huge enablers, for, including for our military planning for, for security. Um, and, uh, you know, from Earth observation, uh, the, the domain that I'm now in, I can say we, we, can, we have a whole digital twin of the planet where we can uh, really analyze what's happening. But on the other hand, we should also see uh, look at the, uh, at the vulnerabilities that uh, they um, they imply and our reliance on um, on this. So when we're saying uh, innovating the alliance is not just about employing the most innovative technologies into what we're doing, but also um, bringing innovation into the strategic thinking, the institutional build up, the planning, going beyond what I would call an analog hangover and moving forward in the digital world with the thinking with the uh, work ahead. No, I'm turning to you from an in industry perspective. It's quite strange to think that as much as the, the, the governments involved in NATO have uh, billions of dollars of budgets, but a lot of the, the tech innovation and frankly the money is coming from, from industry right now, both with yourselves and, and, and others. Where do you fit into this puzzle? Where You as a patentee, but also the industry itself, what could you bring to the table that maybe some of the governments can't? I mean, I think the, uh, there's a couple of, of, of pieces to this. The first is, I think, innovating in this space is somewhat different than in the conventional space, right? A, 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 an AI model is never done in the way that a weapon system is done when you field it. And so industry, or especially the tech industry, is used to this conception of constant iteration and innovation and putting things into the field and then making them better over time. Um, and that's something that, honestly, traditional defense industry has not been great at. Um, and and a, so learning from how you actually do this in the field, how does this actually work, what, is, what implications does this have on how you procure and how you build programs is really important. Um, you know, but I think you know, what we can bring to the table from industry is probably relatively straightforward. I, what's, what's interesting to me about right now, though, is where kind of Silicon Valley writ large is in this. And, and I think right now Silicon Valley writ large is actually a, a really serious threat to the security of the West, honestly. Um, you look at things like Google pulling out of Project Maven, um, which is kind of the obvious thing where there's these... these so can you just explain what Project Maven is for those? Project Maven is a, a, a U.S. Department of Defense project to kind of build an AI platform for imagery. Um, incredibly important when there's tremendous amounts of imagery data being generated and understanding what's going on in it. Um, and so you have in the U.S. ostensibly one of the, the companies that's best at, or should be best at this, uh, choosing to walk away from that program. Um, and, and this speaks to a larger, I think, cultural issue, which is, you know, if in... I think in the 80s, if you were to, to turn to a young engineering student at Imperial here and ask her if she, you know, was, was willing to turn her technology and her mind to, to the defense of the nation, she'd probably say, of course. And I think if you ask that same question now, you'd get it probably considered, you know, oh, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to go make ads better somewhere. And I think that's culturally incredibly difficult. And I don't know that, that, that NATO or, honestly, that, that government quite understands what, what the divide is and is ready to bridge it. I find it striking that you say that, that maybe the valley right now is, is sort of not help, is, I think harming is the word you used, the, the, the sort of the, 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 uh, the NATO establishment when it comes to the, this realm. That, that strikes me as sort of counterintuitive, right? But I mean, does it strike tr true with the other panelists that maybe the, the pulling back from some of the, the tech players, many of whom do have access to this technology, is that something that you have also felt in, in your work? 
I can't say it's something I've noticed, but then I'm very new. I was going to ask a different question, though, which is what can we do about it? I mean, I think clarity is, is, is really important. So I think um, not being clear on the ethics of what we're doing, uh, having an open conversation about it, about intention, is really important. Um, I think government has a role in, in providing good foundations. So instead of asking private industry to collect data, go government can take that responsibility and provide really clear guidelines around how this is being used and then create these platforms where industry can innovate on top of. Uh, so rather than Google collecting healthcare data, you know, the NIH collect, can collect healthcare data and then provide that to industry to innovate on, uh, controlled well. So I think clarity is important, but then engaging in the public debate and discussion on what is the role of technology, of people in technology uh, in this space, especially when our adversaries look the way they look. I mean, in, in, with fully integra integrated kind of uh, between the political class, technical class, and, and uh, industry against the common goal, that's quite difficult to meet uh, when we look as splintered as we do. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think linked to this, we have to, to consider the importance of uh, uh, really investing in uh, um, building education uh, and bridging actually technology with uh, policy, uh, legal studies, uh, ethics, um, and, 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 and so on. Um, because uh, otherwise, um, we are living in this uh, separate world and it, it could uh, uh, haunt us. So that's that's uh, number one issue of concern. The, the other aspect is uh, the importance of um, governments to be uh, involved in uh, looking on the, let's say, safety, security uh, implication of the technologies um, upon um, societies, upon uh, people. Especially when I'm thinking about security, we have seen how new technologies are used by adversaries uh, with the kind of what, what was in the past, like carpet bombing effects. You know, uh, just hitting uh, at uh, innocent uh, civilians or non-prepared civilians with uh, um, uh, special uh, techniques, either in cyberspace, in the information sphere, cognitive sphere with uh, artificial intelligence. So for this, uh, we need this combination of education, but also uh, taking some um, role of government and also uh, intergovernmental organizations. Mm -hmm. okay. um, let me start with that sort of ethical debate. I think it's a major debate, uh, but it can also be a sort of uh, uh, rabbit hole that we all jump into, especially those of us who are more political scientists or lawyers, which is the standard training of uh, diplomats and so on. So we, we sort of uh, immediately focus on that, which is even though it's absolutely essential to be firm on our values and to make sure that we have uh, 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 the right standards, uh, but I think it's important to, have, to, to really look at both sides of the coin uh, and, uh, and, and, and to, to be part of that conversation, to make clear that NATO or EU for that matter intend to use technology in an ethical manner or, and that, but not to sort of jump to the, the, you know, discard the technology, whether it's uh, autonomous uh, systems, whether it's uh, uh, the use of AI, uh, of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in, uh, as, as, a, as a threat immediately. Uh, and because we very quickly jump to the sort of a Terminator type of discussion, which is not completely helpful. The, but the second thing, which I think is extremely important, is in the, the engagement with the, the tech community. And I think, uh, Noam, you, you really uh, nailed it in saying, okay, how do we make sure that we, we can work together and that uh, both the tech giants and the, the, the startups are interested in working with institutions like ministries of defense or um, NATO for that matter. And, and there, the, I, I think that we have a, have a sort of a mixed experience. In some cases, you do get people who say, just no, I'm not interested anyways, I'm not making uh, good money and have uh, plenty of ways to make good money and secondly uh, uh, what you do is uh, not what I want to be involved in but on the other hand we do have lots of engagement I spoke at we, we have a couple of, of events uh, uh, in the NATO environment hosted by the NATO communication and information agency um, NITEC, NIAS, uh, sorry has been at those and you know it's kind of fun for me as a NATO official to be sitting in front of 5,000 people I'm the only guy with a tie who are interested in engaging with NATO and, and doing uh, stuff with us and, and getting uh, into our, our world of, of, uh, uh, of, of contracts and things like that. So I think there is uh, lots of room and I think NATO has a, has a uh, sort of pretty good image in that context where it is interesting to engage. The last thing we need to find, and it's just one sentence, is to find the good ways to do it. 
because our processes can be uh, 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 damaging from that perspective because we, we don't like failure. We like to write the requirements and not to be agile in our engagement with industry and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's, I think that's where we need to do our homework. Mm -hmm. And I, I would eventually say that yeah. the most important thing is, is access to real problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at what, what young people want, or people in technology, or what we as companies want, is access to the real problem. Give us that opportunity, not in a lab, not in an innovation hub, not in a corner somewhere. Um, and that's really the, the power that institutions like NATO have, is the ability to open up that access to real problems. And, and I completely agree. I think there are two things we can offer to, uh, to, to young people. One is this access to real life, really important problems, mm -hmm. actually more important than targeting advertisements. Uh, and the other is training. So there's a lot of people coming out of universities at the moment with a good science education, but they're not actually data scientists yet, or, and they're not, or they're not RF scientists, or they're not trained in cybersecurity. All of those are things that we need people who can do them. So I think we have a great opportunity to train people up in those things, maybe offer them a three-year graduate apprenticeship, something like that, and just know that afterwards they're going to leave. They're going to go off and work in our industry. Frankly, that's great because industry needs them too. Universities do this all the time. We call it a PhD studentship. And it's just a really great way to get all the energy and innovative thinking of somebody who's just come off a degree into working in science. And uh, it works for us. I think it could work really, really well uh, in, in defense, too. Sorry. If I, if I may just uh, one, uh, one other, uh, add one other issue. And this is the challenge that the new technologies bring to what I would call stability yeah. regimes. Uh, um, you know, previous uh, century was defined by uh, strategic deterrence, arms control, and so on and so forth. These new technologies make some of the previous experiences not so applicable. How do you do arms control for cyber weapons? You don't have the calibers. Uh, you cannot uh, judge them. You cannot even showcase them uh, in order to, to, to make the point. So I think um, it is important that um, especially nation states uh, look at the range of effects which such tools can produce and establish uh, or strengthen uh, some, some rules of uh, responsible um, uh, behavior uh, and link it to international law, uh, see what is applicable. So from, um, uh, from this point of view, I, I know that both EU and, and NATO, as a matter of fact, anchors everything that, uh, that is doing um, with the respect of international law and also establish this kind of values-based community that works together to develop these uh, future norms. Otherwise, we are going to be in the kind of... Uh, uh, continuous destabilizing um, uh, trend, and we, we need to stop this. But in a world of sort of move fast and break things, how, how do you do that at speed to make sure you keep up with the, the evolving technology th threat or opportunity while maintaining some of the, the, the safeguards that you mentioned? It, it seems very difficult to be able to push the, the boundaries but also sort of keep the legitimate controls in place. By being anchored uh, with the, with the uh, different kind of uh, innovation hubs, uh, uh, trying to just have as much cross fertilization with the innovative uh, private sector uh, as possible at the government level and also intergovernmental organizations level. That's the only uh, way cross fertilization and at the same warp speed that the technology is uh, doing. I, I would say that we have to continue to change the way we do business on that, uh, meaning that it is, there are some ways of approaching this that are no longer efficient. Uh, you can't reasonably uh, turn to uh, some of the smarter companies in the world uh, to, uh, today and say, we've written for you a, a 20-page or 2,000-page requirement, uh, and uh, can you come up with a software that will fix that uh, I think the problem-solving approach, uh, the embedded uh, teams, the ability of working together, of bringing you know, the uh, operator in the military next to the uh, engineer at NATO, next to the, the, the company that can bring uh, the, uh, this together, is the way of addressing those challenges. It is very demanding because it, it touches upon very boring topics such as contracting rules and, and things like that. But on the other end, it's the best way. The good news is I think that most uh, of our allies have been working on this by establishing you know, innovation uh, uh, hubs, innovation uh, units, uh, which look also at people and processes, not only at science and technology, which is very important. 
and that's something that we're doing in the NATO environment more and more as well. Uh, uh, you know, I can praise the Allied Command for Transformation for really looking into this and trying to be, to be improving this. Of course, it is an ever, never-ending battle. It's, you know, you're never, you don't say, okay, I've changed one process, it's done. I think we, it's also changing a mindset, which is, uh, which is demanding and, 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 uh, and something that we need to do. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think to that context, what we see is when there is a flagship program, not an innovation hub, not a side thing, a flagship program where one decide, where they decide to procure in a different way and to really look at this from, a, from an outcome-based perspective instead. And honestly, the U.S. military, of all places, which you would maybe not expect to be the, the, the fastest at this, in the last, I think, about two, three years, we've seen a sea change in a willingness to look at, you know, we're not going to write requirements. We're basically going to to spec out what we want the end result to be in terms of capability of the warfighter, mm -hmm. and then you have six months to prove it. Um, and then we're going to buy the thing that actually works best at the end of six months. And to actually do this at scale, again, not in a sideshow program, but hundreds of millions of dollars of money behind it, then companies like us get really, really interested in putting all of our – we're good at taking risk, right? Um, but we want to do it under, under the right conditions, and conditions like that work for us. If I may just give an example of what we are trying to do, and again, I hope it will succeed. We have a program which is called the Alliance Future Surveillance and Control, which is the successor to, you know, the – flagship AWACS, AWACS uh, fleet, uh, you know, the, the, the big planes with a radar dome on, on top. Uh, and this is a 2035 capability, which is technically tomorrow. Uh, the way we are doing it right now in the concept stage is turning to industry and say, what smart ideas do you have? And we don't say it's going to be manned, unmanned, a swarm of capabilities, land-based, space-based, uh, air-based. We just say, what are the smart ideas that you have to propose? So we are exactly in that, in that phase, and we are throwing not enormous amounts of money, but significant amounts of money into the, 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 both the, the traditional defense company, but also the tech companies to say, do you have a new smart approach to this? Uh, and interestingly, uh, and, and we open for competition, so we have multiple contracts on the same notion for this initial concept stage, which will then enable us to narrow the thing. The challenge is, of course, for the next phase to move into, to continue that open spirit rather than, than sort of saying, okay, thank you, you've, you've just helped us write the requirement. I'm conscious of time, and we're going to open up to Q&A in a minute, so... I see your hands going up, so we'll, we'll get to you in, in a second. Um, part of this seems to be a mentality shift. You, the idea you have to be more nimble, frankly, not something the defense industry or, frankly, governments have been quite known for in the past. Uh, and in your role as, sort of, as a scientific advisor to the UK's MOD, how do you put that in place? How do you get people to start thinking to the US government's example of trying to, okay, we'll give you six months, go hack away, and we might give you a contract? How do you change people's minds to, to get, start thinking in a different manner? So I think, as, as Noam described, we're actually quite good at doing it in little ways. And I think for us, the big challenge is how to find the daring to do it in a big way. Uh, and and I, I think we're, we're, we're taking a deep breath and gearing ourselves up to seeing if we could do that. Uh, because even in three months, I can see that we as a government department know that we have to change, which I think is always a big step. Knowing what it is you need to do is, is the first step to doing that thing. Um, laying the risk off to somebody else sounds great. <laughs> um, so, so given, uh, I think that would be a good way forward. And also embracing risk, yeah, the ability that, to use your example, after six months you might have spent some money and failed, right, but learned along the way. Um, so I believe there are individuals in the audience who have questions and there was uh, microphones. What I'm going to do is take a couple questions and then so we can get to as many as possible. We can go, um, this gentleman over here had his hand up first and then anyone on this side of the audience has a question. Okay, we're going to come to the lady over here. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Razin. I'm founder of Hydroco. It's a company focused on biotechnology and AI. Also, I'm also a student at the University of Glasgow. So my question is, um, how can the weaponization of AI, um, you know, as in like, you know, the rise of deep fakes disturb the peace in the world? And how can NATO um, encounter that as well as um, um, 
Another thing that I would like to ask is about Google's uh, quantum supremacy that got recently demonstrated. So how, how do we prepare for a post-quantum world? And in doing so, how could you also bring in emerging te um, technology um, uh, startup companies from emerging um, economies into the scene for NATO to work with? So these are my two questions. Good. Thank you. I guess three there. Before we go uh, to answers, have a quick thing. There's a lady over here. Could you just give us your name, where you're from, please? Thank you. Uh, Isabel Rocha with BSA Software Alliance, also here with a delegation from Women in International Security. Um, I have a question relating between sort of the commercial area in which those companies operate and how they cater to specific needs from an organization like NATO. In a commercial area, companies are facing trends of protectionism where data has to be stored locally or they have to use um, local standards as opposed to global standards. They have to consider increasingly privacy, ethical considerations, not opining on whether this is good or bad, but this is just the reality in which they operate. I'm curious from the panelist's view, how does that impact, again, uh, how companies are able to cater to NATO's specific needs and if those are considerations that NATO is looking at as well in terms of how it plans future procurement. Thank you. Great, thank you. So let's start off with the first one, sort of how does NATO respond to deep fakes, I believe, just to paraphrase your question. Any, anyone want to take that? Uh, let me, first of all, um, we do recognize that as part of the sort of a, a battle domain is information domain in many ways. Uh, we are confronted with more and more challenges in this and in a way what used to be the role of our colleagues in uh, public diplomacy uh, like organizing events like this one is also to get a, a, a be constantly uh, aware of what's happening in this, in this era and how do we counter uh, disinformation campaigns, some of them based on deep fakes, and there, there are, you know, that we do need some, some tools to do that. And uh, this is something that is, uh, you know, there is a growing awareness, and now is how do we move from awareness to being actually able uh, to counter that and to uh, uh, recognize that there is uh, something ongoing or that there is a campaign that is uh, really, and of course NATO is uh, a, you know, often a target on that. Uh, the second thing we, ca we can do as NATO is to look at, at uh, what, uh, you know, the setting the best norms and practice. It's interesting that in the cyber domain, the so-called Tallinn manual, which is recognized as the sort of uh, basic for good practice in cyber, was established in a NATO center of excellence. Uh, it is not a NATO approved document, but this, is, this was created in a, in a NATO environment. So from that perspective, it, you, you can see where when 29 nations work together, uh, uh, the, the experts from those multiple communities, they can emerge a norm that helps uh, addressing those new challenges coming from technology. Um, yes, I, I, just to, to follow up uh, on the same line, I think the, the, the best way is to, to really think that it's AI that can counter AI. It's just like a network uh, counters a, uh, a network. And I, I can give you a couple of examples um, in my current job and also previous one at, uh, at NATO, whereby uh, AI is already used as a huge uh, enabler, for example, in Earth observation to, to scan large surfaces, oceans, and so on, and really depict those elements uh, that are important and this, uh, this is not done anymore by the human eye, it's done by artificial intelligence and the human eye then focuses on the flag that appears in, an, uh, in those aspects and that also this gives anticipation um, uh, capacity uh, so that uh, you're not looking for a needle in a haystack, uh, it's, it's the AI that finds the anomalies and anticipates trends. Uh, in cyber, in NATO, uh, there are so-called analytical uh, tools that the cyber threat assessment cell um, it uses uh, in order to depict uh, uh, the, the kinds of attacks, including the false flag attacks and, and so on. And I think also on, uh, in terms of uh, uh, fake news, NATO is a kind of platform of fact checking. checking in, uh, Sorry, in I'm going to have to stop you there. Um, I want to get through as many questions as possible. Excuse me. To the lady's point over here about data localization, privacy, ethics, and how that you know, does NATO cater to that? I mean, so uh, looking at this from our perspective, uh, it is interesting to, to, to be part of the emerging discussion around national champions, even within NATO. 
uh, and, and in the same way that, that people were concerned about where, where the parts of the fighter jet are coming from, people are now concerned about where the, the AI models are coming from. Um, and that's, that's kind of fascinating to see. And it, and it is definitely slowing things down. Uh, we see the beginnings of kind of protectionism even within the different NATO countries around their national champions in each space. I would say in that space, what's interesting is to look at the speed at which the U.S. is, is able to operate um, because of the U.S. Gov Cloud, and I know that this sounds like incredibly boring, but honestly, their investment in having a secret and top secret cloud infrastructure means that they can small companies and interesting ideas can be deployed incredibly quickly versus a lot of the European states where this is incredibly unclear and getting something certified and operating on a network is, is incredibly tedious. And it seems like a technicality, but it definitely uh, sets the speed at which one can deploy innovation into these places. Same thing goes for privacy assessments and, and, uh, and other pieces. And, and the speed at which one can deploy new tech and learn if it works in the field is incredibly determinative of, of one's capability today. Angela? I want to grab the quantum computing question because that's such a great question. So what's it going to be like in a post-quantum computing world? Well, we all know that uh, our existing cryptography isn't going to work so well and that's going to be tricky. But there's also just so many really, really exciting new bits of science that we're going to be able to do because there's a lot of computational work. I'm a computational biologist on Fridays. Um, there's, there, you know, there are so many things where we know what calculation we need to do, but we just can't do it because there isn't enough time. And I think particularly in computational chemistry, and also, I would say this, in computational biology, a whole swathe of things become possible uh, that simply haven't been possible up to now. Well, for us in defense, of course, we, we would think about um, materials and energetics, but then also about biologicals, so things that will uh, affect uh, uh, and, uh, well, for example, will make fantastic new kinds of therapeutics for people. I think if you think how far we've already come uh, in computational science, uh, it's impossible not to be tremendously excited uh, about what, you know, several, several orders of magnitude more computational capability is going to do for us. And for defence, that is exciting too. And one of the things we can do is put money into the bits that are really useful for us and by the standards of, of small, young bits of science, our money can make a huge amount of difference. I think on that very optimistic note, we have to call it a day. Uh, I'd like to do a round of applause for the panellists. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for a fantastic panel. Uh, okay, uh, you're all waiting for your daily fix of what has President Macron said about NATO today. Uh, and while we've been in this session, we've had a fascinating press conference with President Trump, President Macron, um, and we've heard him say our common enemy is Islamic terrorism. Russia is not the threat it was. Times have changed. There is no Warsaw Pact. I can't wait to hear what our next panelists have to say about that, their perspective on this. Um, the next session is going to be about NATO's front lines, from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Many of you will be familiar with the fact that, as has been mentioned this morning, NATO has uh, battle groups uh, in Eastern Europe uh, for the first time in its history. What you may not know is that the Black Sea is also becoming an increasing site of competition. I was lucky enough to spend a week this summer on, um, on the Black Sea on a U.S. destroyer and a Ukrainian frigate as they exercised for exercise sea breeze. And NATO ship numbers in the Black Sea have gone up year on year in the last few years uh, as that has become more of a focus for the alliance. So uh, from all the way uh, in the north to the southeastern flank, um, we're going to have an excellent discussion now. Please welcome Bill Neely from NBC News. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Uh, good afternoon. Our focus on this, in this session is on NATO's front line from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Seventy years ago, the countries you're about to hear from, of course, were part of the Soviet bloc. Four of the five, in fact, were part of the Soviet Union, and NATO's mission was to keep them out of the West. Well, things change. NATO's frontier has moved. Russia feels threatened, or at least it says it does. And these states are on the front line. So how safe do they feel? Does NATO do enough to reassure 
and to deter. And who scares them more? President Putin, President Trump, President Erdogan. Uh, please welcome our guests for this session, beginning uh, from uh, Ukraine with the Foreign Minister Vadim Pristaiko. From Georgia, the Foreign Minister David Zalkaliani. From Lithuania, the Defence Minister Raimundas Karoblis. From Estonia, the Defence Minister Yuri Luik. And finally, from Romania, the Defence Minister Nikolai Chuka. Uh, as you settle yourself, gentlemen, I'd actually like to take a, a vote, just a quick poll here from the audience. Could you please raise your hands if you believe the greatest challenge to NATO in 10 years' time will be Russia? Well, that's certainly not unanimous. In fact, that's 50% or less. And just one other, other uh, quick question. Is NATO right now doing enough on its eastern frontier? Please raise your hands if you think it is doing enough. It, can you raise your hands if you think NATO is doing enough on its eastern border? And I think that's very, very few. <laughs> Let's see if these gentlemen can convince you at all or if things change by the end of the session. I would like to start with some brief comments for, uh, from each of you. Uh, I, I am going to keep them brief, if possible. Uh, we'll start no particular order except from north to south. So I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Yuri Luik uh, from Estonia. What is the big challenge that you face, and is NATO doing enough? Well. To be honest, the, the big challenge is what was pointed out here with the show of hands, which is Russia. I mean, I think Russia has shown with its actions that it is a serious security threat. And the fact that uh, there are troops in Estonia, EFP troops, uh, British and French at the moment, I think are a great testament that NATO is doing a lot in uh, supporting its uh, easternmost uh, members. And when people speak about Russia threats and ask whether it's high or low, I always say that this depends on what we do. If we are serious in our actions, if we are clear and concise in our messaging, then the threat is quite low. But if we are weak, if we are wobbly, then the threat can go up. I think the biggest problem at the moment is not the forward presence of NATO troops. They are there. It's a small presence, but they are there. But what we need is more exercises showing how we bring in additional troops if they are necessary reinforcements if they are necessary and there have been a huge amount of important exercises now just an exercise uh, was finished called tractable which was a large british exercise and next year we are very excited to look forward to an exercise <coughs> defender uh, 2020 which is a huge u.s exercise in europe so it depends on what we do Thanks. Mr. Karoglis from, from Lithuania, I, I was in Vilnius in 1990 when Soviet troops attacked your television station during the battle for independence. Do you still fear Russian troops? Is NATO doing enough for you? Uh, it's doing quite, quite a lot indeed. And, uh, well, you mentioned 1990, of course, after that we had all in Europe, we had so rosy glasses period when we are looking very optimistically with the Russia and thought that there are chances for Russia, but the war uh, you know, against uh, Georgia in 2008, and in particular <clears throat> after the attempts of, of, of uh, reset of the relations, which was unsuccessful, it was, uh, of course, the aggression against Ukraine, and it's, 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 it's continue. So Russia, unfortunately, is, uh, continues with this threat to, to, to our region to both to Baltic region and, and Black, in the Black Sea region. 
and for Lithuania it's the now it's the only existential external threat which we have. It's without any, any doubts. If the country do not, does not respect uh, international obligations, if it does not respect sovereignty, independence, territorial of integrity of countries, and also if, it, if its continued actions to disrespect and to continue with influence in its neighborhood, it means that it's a real threat. And I think to, from 2014 it was done quite, quite a lot. And Yuri has mentioned already so this, this EFP uh, need to enhance forward presence. We have the leaders of, of Germany enhancing of the air police, adapt, adaptation of, of a NATO structure, so which is really also very, very important. Uh, the readiness initiative, of course, it's again about uh, the conventional threat, which in our view, first of all, is, is, is Russia. What we need to, to, to have more? Exercises definitely, so we're looking to this time U.S. 2030 defender exercises, but of course NATO as, as such is also involved here. And uh, yes, but also other measures which we, which, which we need, so air defense, which we are still lacking, more precise defense planning, and uh, well, other similar measures. But I think uh, Lithuania has never had such number of, of, of guarantees as and, 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 and allies as we have now, and this is really important. So Russia, the only existential threat. Mr. Chuka from uh, Georgia, arguably the Black Sea situation is more complicated, more players. We have, for example, Turkey. Uh, do you feel that Russia is the only threat to you? Uh, of course. Uh now, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to address this audience and to talk about the uh, top foreign policy priority for Georgia, which is uh, full integration uh, to NATO. And uh, uh, the Georgia is uh, one of the most advanced country, aspirant country, and uh, it's uh, well recognized for our fact that, that there are all practical tools for which Georgia has, uh, the annual national program, NATO Georgia Council, as well as substantial national uh, NATO Georgia package, uh, which uh, is really very helpful for to, to speed up the process of uh, the actual goal of Georgia, which is a full membership. At the same time, the, the region, in the Black Sea region, which is becoming more and more important place uh, of attention to NATO. Uh, the, the, one of the main security challenge comes from uh, Russia. As we speak right now, the process of uh, occupation is going on in Georgia. It's a legal process of borderization, installation, installation of barbed wire fences and artificial barriers across the occupation line. People are kidnapped, they are detained in illegal custody. The normal people are suffering there, and uh, just recently the, uh, the, the, the famous Georgian doctor was kidnapped and sentenced uh, to illegal custody. Unfortunately, for the time being, he's still there, and we are trying to consolidate support of international community. But uh, um, uh, it's uh, what we are facing there is a, uh, uh, the humanitarian disaster. And we, uh, in response to this, we are trying to consolidate support, and uh, we believe that uh, the, uh, the Georgia's way towards integration to uh, EU Atlantic structure is uh, uh, not directed against the third party. It's, uh, it's for, for strengthening our defense capability, for strengthening our resilience. You have mentioned Turkey, which is important. Uh, um, um, country in the Black Sea region. It's a literal state, um, uh, also a member of the NATO. And uh, we, have, we are developing very strong strategic partnership with Turkey. So Turkey is a very strong ally to Georgia. So Turkey still continues uh, and will continue to support Georgia's NATO aspiration and Georgia's, uh, uh, supporting Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. So it's in our interest to stabilize the security situation in the region with uh, taking into consideration all legitimate interests of all NATO uh, member states and the, uh, the, the uh, literal states of the, the Black Sea region, because without secure Black Sea, there will be no security in the EU Atlantic uh, EU, uh, security space. L let me bring in Ukraine, because like Georgia, you have faced Russian troops, uh, Crimea annexed. Uh, part of your country uh, invaded. I was in Donbass earlier this year and it didn't seem safe to me. Do you feel safe, reassured in any way by NATO? We have President Trump playing games, it seems, with aid, military aid to your country. 
I agree with you, and you know what I'd like to tell you immediately that by the number of hands which were raised on your question, I came to two conclusions. First of all, too few Ukrainians in the room. <laughs> Second of all, we are failing as Ukrainians, as Ukrainian foreign affairs, to explain to the rest of you who are not Ukrainians what is the real threat to all of you. We have 14,000 people dead. Just because they decided to, to impose their political system, will wish whatever they, they have to. And we are casually discussing what could be the biggest threat in this region. What I see that, yes, the north of Europe, the Baltic states, Poland, now under the focus of the, of the NATO, we can talk about more or less troops. I'm not NATO myself. I, I can give the recommendation. What I see that we are the, we overlooking the uh, region of Black Sea for many, many years. We believe collectively we're not, we are not subscribing with NATO. We are not member of NATO. It's our fault. We didn't become, but we believe that this region is safe because of the presence of the NATO, because of the Turkey. Now we have to understand, all of us, what Turkey is. And here I am on the same page as NATO because this is neighbor, this is somebody who is keeping the keys to the Black Sea, where we happen to live. So if we are losing this you know, concentration, because there are so many other priorities, south of Europe, other parts of the globe, we believe that we are left on our own. And this was something which like, we would like to, to avoid. And Reciprocating on your quite provocative question, I have to give you another thing, which Ukrainians sometimes asking uh, Westerners, especially the NATO, telling guys, we actually, whether you like it or not, defending your eastern flank. And sometimes we've been hearing, who ask you for? Why would you do it? We'd never ask you to defend our flank. We are quite capable in defending. So do you believe that Ukrainians so the input is needed, or Ukraine's role is important to NATO as much as we see the NATO is important, at least in our part of the region. And Mr. Chuka, from, from Romania's point of view, Black Sea as well, uh, do, do you feel that the only threat to you might be Russia, or is it a resurgent Turkey, and is NATO doing enough for you? You're in, they're not in. Is, from the inside, is NATO doing enough? Uh, sir, uh, the Black Sea, it has a very... Uh, geostrategical relevance taking into account that it links Europe, Asia, and Middle East. So, uh, taking into account that since uh, 2008 and 2014, since Russia invaded Crimea and created in the Black Sea an outpost from where it is projecting their forces where they are interested for um, I do uh, consider that um, um, the, and the, the Black Sea is, is having a very, very important relevance for all the NATO and European countries. And uh, I think, back to your first question, if NATO is doing enough, uh, I will start saying that Russia is looking to the eastern flank as a whole. What we did, we are having two different decisions. We are having EFP in the uh, Baltic and Poland area, and we are having the TFP in the Black Sea region. I am not saying that to compete with the measures taken in, in, in the northern part of the eastern flank. Uh, what I am saying is that NATO and EU needs to have a very coherent approach to the whole flag, to the whole flag. So um, uh, what, what is now happening in, in, in the Black Sea is that uh, we are having three main partners, Ukraine, Georgia, and Republic of Moldova. Um, we are having three NATO riparian countries of the Black Sea. Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. So all our activities are, are planned and conducted together. And um, I can say that taking into account the Romanian initiatives to set up a, a multinational brigade, a multinational division, now multinational core headquarters, all of these are done 
on our money and with the participation of all the NATO countries and very much looking to the partners to be part of that. So I do really uh, believe that we need to focus on strengthening the NATO and EU presence and also the NATO and EU, EU cooperation in order to support the uh, partnership countries of NATO and the EU as well. So it would appear that President Macron doesn't agree with what the panelists have said because in that famous interview with The Economist he said Russia isn't NATO's biggest threat, that's terrorism. Just, just anyone at all, was that a wise thing to say? Was it, as President Trump said this morning, a dangerous thing to say? Uh, if I may say, uh, sorry for us. Yes? Uh, uh, not uh, involving myself again. Um, I think here in, in the Black Sea region, we should not forget the Balkans. And this morning, somebody was asking, is the Balkans, is the Balkan to be considered the soft belly of the alliance? I think if we will not take all the measures to consider the threats coming from east, the threats coming from south as well, because here we have a crossroad, this is going to become the soft belly of the alliance. So this is my personal opinion. So on President Macron's view that terrorism is the key threat to NATO, President Trump saying this morning uh, President Macron's comments were, were dangerous. At least I would, would, would repeat what I told. For Lithuania, the, for Lithuania, Russia is the only existential threat. And, and, and really that's it. And I think also for, for full NATO, at least the eastern flank of NATO. And how it's possible to say that, uh, well, we, we can't uh, agree with, with, with this uh, suggestion. Uh, well, in particular, if Russia, of course, uh, its military doctrine says that uh, uh, so the NATO is the adversary of Russia and uh, ex exercising and con concentrating its main and most capable military forces. It's, it's impossible to say that Russia is, is not uh, posing threat. Regarding terrorism, yes, it's, it's also another area of, 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 of NATO work, but we also, we are ready and we continue our efforts there. We are, our troops are in Afghanistan, Iraq and, and, and Mali and, and elsewhere. So we really need to, to cover all the areas where we see NATO as, as the defense alliance, see the, the, the threats. Russia. Uh, terrorism and, of course, uh, strategic competition with, with, with China. Minister, was it wise of President Macron to open up yet another divide in NATO by saying this? Well, I agree with my Lithuanian colleague. I think the key is uh, uh, we, we very much appreciate the fact that uh, uh, terrorism is a major threat. Looking from our point of view, it's clear that uh, Russia is the as my Lithuanian colleague said, existential threat, meaning that it's a nation state which, having enormous military capabilities, can exert enormous damage. So, deterring uh, Russia, the only organization which can viably do that is NATO. So, if we talk about the role of NATO, and I believe that's very clear. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight terrorism. For instance, the biggest Estonian operation now abroad is in Mali. And it is together with the French. It's uh, a military mission called Barkhan. Uh, so nobody should tell us that we are not investing enough to work and, and, and fight against terrorism. And as my Lithuanian colleague also said, most of our operations are actually in the south, uh, fighting uh, terrorism, maintaining stability. So that's, that's what we do. From Ukraine's point of view, you, you know Russia very well. I mean, is, is President Putin laughing as NATO celebrates its 70th anniversary when arguably there are more splits within NATO than we've seen for a very long time? I believe that he is not laughing. He still appreciates and respects the, the mightness of, of the alliance. That's actually the only language which Putin understands. And I have to bring to your attention that sometimes we are missing. We are trying to achieve deal with him, all of us. And in reality, he understands that's only other language. 
And the second thing is, you know, when you ask about what is terrorism or Russia, I don't actually feel the difference. Terrorist, by default, is somebody who is exerting violence to achieve some political, political something. How can you tell that Russia is not doing the same? Is killing people in Ukraine, is threatening with biological and chemical weapons around the Europe, for what? Just to waste some of the resources of chemical, reducing chemical weapons? No. They are trying to achieve some political goals. So this is a terrorism on a very high state level. How worried... Yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. Yeah. So I think by, ident by identifying the threats and challenges, it's not necessary to divide the alliance. But the alliance should, st should stay united, should analyze all those threats and challenges, and to find the instrumentation in order to cope with all, all, all these, uh, these threats. So I, I've just left the military committee of NATO, and I remember that all the chiefs of defense uh, or uh, uh, very, uh, very clear that the approach of NATO should be 360 degrees, and we, uh, I do really very much believe in that. N NATO should remain united, but of course Turkey has just invaded an Arab country without consulting any NATO ally except perhaps one which green lighted it. I'm, I, I know I'm being provocative here, but honestly, should Turkey be a member of NATO anymore? Do you feel that they are undermining the alliance? Anyone, sir? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, you know, but uh, first, coming back to your previous question, you know, that uh, about the terrorists, whether it's a threat or not, or challenge. Of course, this is a very serious threat and challenge. And uh, what is important to underline that uh, it's, of course, there are 29 members, there are different positions and uh, different uh, uh, evaluation of the current threats and challenges, but it's really important to stay united. The united position, solidarity within NATO partners is really important. You know, as an outsider, but not a member of the NATO, you know, our advice and our wishful thinking for. But I suppose yet. that was my point that Turkey clearly didn't feel any obligation the to Turkey stay is, united. Uh, Turkey is really important player in, in the region. That it's. Uh, uh, needless to um, uh, say, the impor important contribution Turkey is doing uh, for the strengthening of the uh, European security. Uh, of course, there are different uh, positions and different uh, um, assessment of the current situation, but we have to take into consideration the very serious position of Turkey playing in the region for strengthening the uh, security in the Black Sea and the wider Black Sea region and also for the EU Atlantic security. Sir, you wanted to come in. Yeah, of course, Turkey is an important uh, member of the alliance, and uh, I think if people say, when people say that we should bring more issues to the NAC table and discuss them, then let's also recognize how difficult it is. I mean, for a sovereign country to come to the NAC table and put an issue to be debated by all NATO members. Very few countries actually do it. I would say European big countries don't do it, at least not very often. I mean, the United States is perhaps a very good example that it can be done. For instance, the United States brought to the table the IMF treaty and actually achieved, which is quite unique, a unanimous opinion about US leaving uh, IMF treaty and Russia being to be blamed for the uh, violation of the treaty. But as I see Deputy Secretary General of NATO here, as he knows well, uh, people are not necessarily bringing all these issues uh, to the table, and we shouldn't name only Turkey. And, and do, do you, I mean, you mentioned the US there. Do, do you have confidence that if President Trump is re-elected, so we have another five years, uh, that he will maintain his more recent stance towards NATO as opposed to his earlier stance when he said NATO was an obsolete organization. Do you have trust in President Trump in four or five years' time, sir? <clears throat> the answer is yes. And it's not only about the personality of President Trump, but also about the administration in general. It's about also U.S. traditions here. And the transatlantic link, transatlantic bond is really strong. And this question, so the first question I, I, I got when I became a minister was exactly about uh, this, uh, the same as, as, as you, you asked right now. And it's already three and a half years, years ago. 
um, to what, what is on the ground, that during this time we have more American troops in Europe, we have on the ground more engagement, with uh, partially, quite seriously, with the, the U.S. leadership. We have very important agreement on the NATO adaptation, on the enhanced forward presence in the Baltics and Poland. Now deployment of uh, U.S. troops in Poland, which is of critical importance for us, and also this uh, deployment of the for, for half a year at present, which we have, uh, so the battalion of U.S. troops in Lithuania, and the 23rd defender exercises, which we will have the, among the biggest exercises in the region, so after the Cold War. So this demonstrates that full U.S. engagement, its leadership, and uh, we don't have any doubts that it will continue. Minister Pashaiko, do, do, do you feel the same way? I mean, as I said earlier, Mr. Trump <coughs> appears to be playing games with your military aid. Uh, you know, I'm getting back to my favorite topic, Russia. Uh, that's more or less the same, same page, but from different sides. Yes, I agree completely. Uh, President Trump will get to understand NATO more and administration. It's like with the Russia. Each and every administration tried their way. Somebody was looking in trying to find Seoul. Somebody else was pushing big red button to restart the relations. And it's been part of American uh, modern history, uh, polit polit political history, to try to, to reset and to relaunch relations with Russia, which is, was, was and is and will be failing each and every time. And administration will know it, sometimes in a hard way, sometimes they will be much more flexible from the very beginning. And that's not just American, NATO itself. And in Ukraine, look at us, we are, we are trying. My, my new president is trying to reach out to Putin and understand how we can get the, this course settled and how, how can we get out of the war. That's what all of us were honestly trying. And this will bring us all to, unfortunately, I'm not happy with that, to, to understanding that we have to reinforce alliance and to understand that, unfortunately, Russia is not with, with this us part. Mr. Chuka, I know you had your hand up. And then I'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience. Sir. Okay. Uh, sir, I think the first we have to trust on President Trump is the American people. Uh, we trust very much because we are having a very strong uh, strategic uh, uh, partnership with the United States. And uh, as I mentioned, we are having our uh, uh, initiatives, and those are part of the TFP, and the uh, very relevant presence in, uh, within those uh, uh, initiatives are the American soldiers. So I can say that in the last period of time, the United States has increased uh, the, the presence. We are hosting also the um, uh, um, uh, uh, American uh, uh, airfield air uh, and air base, so that's also very important for us. And uh, we are very much looking forward on uh, um, developing all these relationships, taking into account the uh, challenges in the Black Sea. To be fair to President Trump, he gets a lot of uh, stick, but he has authorized greater defense contributions uh, in the last few years. Lady here with her hand up, please, a question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, my name is Sadiha Chowdhury, and I'm a sixth form student, um, hoping to study politics and social sciences next year. And my question is kind of slightly off tangent, but it's in regards to refugees. And I kind of wanted to know each of your opinions on how refugees are handled, not just in your own countries, but, but globally. And if you personally think that there's room for this to be improved, and if so, in what way? So the refugee wave, which can also be a destabilizer, it can be an issue of national security, sir. Easy with me. We have, we have our own almost two million refugees because of the war, mm -hmm. which we have to adapt within Ukraine. We're not sending another wave to Europe. We're doing it right now. So we do understand and feel the pain of the refugees. So we are understanding solid in solidarity with these people who are trying to find their safe heavens, bringing their kids and the rest of the belongings. Same is about Georgia. We have our own refugees and uh, more than 300,000, almost 400,000. It's almost 10% of Georgian population. We have our internally displaced persons and people are really suffering. You know, that we, what we are facing in our occupied regions is a humanitarian disaster. The population is decreasing uh, five, uh, six times and uh, 
uh, the, the, the we are dealing with the problem. We have our moral and legal obligation toward these people, you know, to alleviate suffering of those who are displaced because of uh, occupation and uh, creeper annexation of these territories. I, I, I'm going to push it on because I think we probably we, we can all agree that the refugee wave from Syria and elsewhere, not least in this country with Brexit, has been a destabiliser. Lady here. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, ministers, for uh, engaging us in such a fascinating discussion. I'm Elena Poptodorova from the Bulgarian Atlantic Club. Um, and yes, uh, Minister Chuk, I was the one who raised the uh, alarm, so to say, over the Balkans becoming the soft belly uh, of transatlantic security, if not measures are taken. Um, actually, I happen to be one of those who think it's about NATO doing too little too late. The Atlantic Club of Bulgaria has long uh, argued the need, the necessity of enhanced NATO presence in the Black Sea. Experts claim that there is a disbalance of six to one uh, superiority for, for Russian uh, maritime presence in, in the Black Sea. So my question to you gentlemen would be, ministers, would be uh, given the restrictions of the Montreal Convention, how do you think we can go about it? Uh, do you think NATO would be prepared for enhanced uh, military um, exercises, presence, rotating presence, if you wish, in order to make sure that we can achieve the goal, being respectful at the same time of realities which we cannot change now? I, okay. I, I, I will take that one. Um, um, yeah, you're right. The Montreal Convention is limiting in some way the uh, NATO presence in the Black Sea. But I can tell you that in the last two, three years, we were having a NATO presence uh, at least for 160, even 185 days per year. But um, I do very much trust in all the NATO European countries to develop their own maritime capabilities in order to have uh, the instrumentation to be able to uh, respond by themselves and also to support any NATO presence in the uh, in the Black Sea. I, I gather, Mr. Yeah. Chief, you have to leave. Uh, Very sorry for that. It is an important engagement. There was a gentleman at the back there who had his hand up. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Vajotas Benicius. I'm a journalist from uh, Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, Mr. Karoblis, in his introductory remarks, said that among things that uh, Lithuania needs is more precise defense planning. I would like to ask Lithuanian and Estonian ministers whether you believe that uh, you would find solution with Turkey during this leaders' meeting uh, to get approved, updated NATO defense plans for Baltics and for Poland, and why they are important for the security. Thank you. And I would add to that, do you feel that you're being taken hostage by Turkey, that they're blackmailing NATO? Well, I would not uh, say that it's about uh, blaming that. Yeah, this is one of, first of all, we have defense plans. And it's the, the revision of that, of course, to, to, to have more precision in similar aspects and to have the adjustment. And it's one of the, only one of the topics we, we have in NATO. And, and, we, 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 and of course, uh, so among others. And uh, really, so the life is, is, is continued. And regarding the results, we'll see. So the, the, the meeting, the summit, the leaders' meeting will start now. But um, uh, earlier or later, during this meeting or, or, or later, of course, we will, we will find the, 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 the solutions. We see the, the, the progress. And it's one of the issues. So NATO is, is the alliance, alliance of 29 countries. Naturally, the, the positions from time to time, they, they differ. And the beauty of the alliance is that we are finding the solutions. And I, I am sure that also we will find the solution earlier or later on this issue too. Mr. Lewick, I think the question was for you as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, the discussions are going on all the time. Obviously, there are opportunities during the summit, uh, attempts to find a compromise. If we don't find a compromise here, we hopefully will find it uh, a bit later. But I'm absolutely sure that we find a compromise. I have no doubt about that. But it's very important to understand that Baltic states have defense plans. 
defense plans related to Article 5. So it's not that we are lacking defense plans as such. Uh, I'm also a bit sad that the issue of defense plans, which according to NATO's uh, usual procedure are not to be discussed openly uh, at all, have become a major subject of discussion all, all around the world. But that's how, that's how the mod modern world works. Just a very brief question to Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, you were promised membership. I mean, it was more than that. You were approved, if you like, more than 10 years ago, uh, and, and still you're waiting outside the door. I mean, do, do, do you feel frustrated? Do you feel... Are you beginning to feel that you could be betrayed by NATO? Mr. Zalkin? You, you are absolutely right. The decision uh, made in, uh, during the Bucharest uh, summit in, back in 2008 was more than 10 years ago, and uh, this is the decision where uh, clearly describes that Georgia will become the NATO member. Uh, since then, there were a lot of summit meetings and also with the different decisions and declarations that Georgia will become a NATO member. Uh, of course, uh, that we realize that the current situation within the NATO, that uh, there is uh, no political decision made yet, but we are fully using all the existing practical tools, as I have mentioned, the implementation of annual national program as well, NATO Georgia Council, the substantial NATO Georgia package, which is also important practical way to speed up the process of Georgia's full integration, moving Georgia closer to the eventual membership. So these are the very important instruments. At the same time, Georgia is already acting like an ally. So we are in the same line as uh, the, the NATO standards, uh, the, for example, on burden sharing. 2% we are spending on GDP, 20% on major military acquisition. Georgia is the biggest per capita uh, contributor to the resolute support mission in Afghanistan. Although we have suffered casualties, 32 Georgians died in Afghanistan for a small country like Georgia. It's quite a big loss, but we realize that this is our contribution to the global security. Of course, when this is not reciprocated. When a country like Georgia delivers, it has to be reciprocated. We need a practical political solution. But uh, we are not discouraged by this fact. We are continuing our vigorous efforts. We are working bilaterally with all the uh, members of the alliance, so with the strategic partner, with the uh, United States, with Turkey, with France, with Germany, to increase our defense uh, and security capabilities in order to increase our resilience. So we are doing everything possible to prepare country for the momentum. When this momentum is uh, when, uh, when momentum to, to come, we have to be ready for this. Moment. And, and very briefly, from Kiev's point of view, if you're not in NATO in 10 years' time, what, what would that say? What would you do? Thanks to my Georgian friends, I had the time to, you know, to gather all my diplomatic 20-plus <laughs> years to describe in the diplomatic terms, what happened in, in Bucharest, I believe, is a great mistake. That we were not allowed, first of all, we were promised to be a member of NATO. Then it was an idea that membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia is resolved, and by the end of the year, ministers of foreign affairs had to report to, to their uh, respective leaders to tell how it's, it's working. It's been more than 10 years, and we are not invited neither to MAP nor to membership. So I believe the indecisiveness of NATO at that time and since then allowed Russia first to invade Georgia and then in six years to come to Ukraine. Uh, just before we finish, just another question to the audience, because one thing we haven't talked about is China. I'm afraid that is uh, a, a, another subject. But should NATO, just a show of hands again, in 10 years' time, should NATO's focus be as much on China and the challenge from China as it is on Russia. Raise your hands if you think China is equally important for NATO in 10 years' time. Well, that's the biggest show of hands so far, and maybe we should pause or maybe end there. Maybe we've just got time, literally 10 seconds. What would your message be to NATO? Really short, snappy. What would your message be to NATO for the next 10 years, priorities? China. Change. China. China. <coughs> Sir. Georgia. Please keep Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and, for, 
Unfortunately, I think that Russia will continue. Still, the mid, mid, mid term threat will be Russia. But China, yes, will be second, and, and the challenges with China will increase. Definitely. Sir, you get the last word. NATO is a unique organization. A unique organization. No NATO country has ever been attacked by a nation state. This is my me measure of real success. Let's keep NATO alive because it is a framework. It's like a constitution of a country. I mean, there might be those politicians and these politicians, but nobody says, let's cancel the constitution because one or the other politician you don't like. NATO is the constitution of the European security. I think that's the basic message I would deliver. So much we, we haven't talked about China. Uh, the cyber threat, climate change, should NATO look east? Should it look up to space? But I think we have covered some of the present problems. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much for sharing a fantastic session. Let's pick up where we left off. If we could all please take our seats or exit quietly. I'm not trained for crowd control. Thank you. Uh, let's pick up where Bill left off and move very far away from the Alliance's eastern flank. Uh, we know that Australia is one of the Alliance's most important global partners. Excuse me, folks. Could you all please move out of the hall if you're going to have conversations? We'd appreciate that very much. Thank you. We know that Australia is one of the Alliance's most important global partners. We know that it's been side by side with the Alliance on some of its most important counterterrorism operations in recent years, and so may have uh, 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 advice and insight into the question of how NATO engages with counterterrorism looking ahead. But we also know it's at the leading edge of engaging with China's rise in all of its dimensions security, defense, economics, and so on. So we're very, very pleased to have an Australian perspective here next. Please join us in welcoming former Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs and Executive Chair of the International School for Government at King's College, Alexander Downer. Well, thanks um, very much for having me at this conference. And you might think having an Australian here is a bit out of context. Um, and what I want to do is try it in the five minutes I have available to me to try to put my country in a context which makes it highly relevant to NATO in the future. So we don't live in 1949. The world has completely changed. And uh, when I was the Foreign Minister of Australia, which was between 1996 and 2007, one of the thoughts I had was we need to engage with NATO, and I was the first Australian minister ever to address the North Atlantic Council. Now, why did I do that? The most important single geopolitical issue in the world today isn't anything to do with Europe. It's the rise of China. Uh, now, we don't want to confront China. We don't want to pursue a policy of containment of China. We want to engage with China. But a country like mine, an ally of the United States, and countries like Japan and Korea in the Indo-Pacific region, also allies of the United States, we uphold liberal democratic values. Um, we support um, democracy in its broad sense, international norms of human rights, and very importantly, the rule of international law. And it's those values, and if you like, those policies, in particular the support for the rule of international law, which we have entirely in common with NATO. And we also have in common with NATO um, an almost identical alliance relationship with the United States of America, which of course dominates NATO. So in this um, more globalized world, where you might question what threats you face in Europe and whether the transatlantic relationship matters so much anymore, our submission to you is that you should think, you should think globally. 
We shouldn't just think regionally. And we should be thinking about how the liberal democracies of the world, those countries that share those liberal democratic values, those countries that want to uphold the rule of international law, those countries that believe in international norms of human rights, those countries that think those things are going to contribute to a stable and happier world, how we as countries work together better than we have done so far. I don't want to portray an image of us believing that the rise of China, um, a sort of recalcitrant Russia, of certainly not a rise of Russia, a declining power, but nevertheless a difficult power, or a country like Iran, are countries that the whole time we need to confront. They are countries that need to understand that there is a great body of nations in this world which uphold those broader liberal democratic values and which cooperate with each other and coordinate policies with each other. So, very quickly, NATO embraced countries like Australia from outside of NATO but allies of the United States in Afghanistan where we work together very easily. Common doctrines, of course, I mentioned earlier common alliance with the United States, in our case, a very strong and historic relationship with the United Kingdom as well. We were able to work hand in glove with NATO in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is not, of course, in the North Atlantic region. So it was where NATO started, if you like, to spread its wings. So what we would like to see is an outward-looking NATO a NATO that not only embraces partners like Australia, Japan, Korea in the Indo-Pacific region, um, but that NATO starts to think of itself more as the centrepiece of, if you like, very broadly defined Western security architecture. So I can imagine in the years ahead at the NATO summit, you wouldn't just have the Australian foreign minister turn up you would have the Australian Prime Minister, you would have the Japanese Prime Minister, you would have the Korean President, you would have these people participate in the summit. Because nowhere in this world today do Western countries get together in that way to coordinate security policy. And NATO can be the catalyst to build a stronger, more global alliance of Western liberal democratic powers. And I can see up there it says my time is up, so I hope I've delivered my message to you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have a 10-minute coffee break. The program will resume at 4.40. That's 25, ladies and gentlemen, back in your seats by 4.40. Thank you. <laughs>